Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Planning Applications Committee meeting of the uh, 18th of October. Can I remind members that uh, and members of the public that this meeting will be recorded and later made available for public listening? Can we ensure all mobile phones are either switched off or placed on a airplane mode, please? Uh, Nick, can you confirm Cedrant and apologies, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. We've had apologies from um, Councillor Carruthers, Councillor Fairburn, um, Councillor McComb, um, and also apologies for lateness from Councillor Doogie Campbell. Um, we have 16 members present at the start of the meeting. Thanks, Nick. Declarations of interest, members. John Martin. Hi, I'm seven. One of my relatives is an objector. Do I believe in the meeting? Thank you. Any other declarations, David? Uh, yes. Um, item 8. I own land um, beside item 8, so I don't think I'm a suitable person to take part in the committee's deliberations on that. And I've also reflected um, on the wind farm situation, and um, I've come to the conclusion that um, under current legislation, the uh, cost and benefits don't stack up for the interest of Dumfries and Galloway. So, in answering uh, Councillor McKee's question, I think uh, enough is enough, so I'm no longer a suitable person to deliberate on future wind farms in Dumfries and Galloway. I take it that's your view and, and no anyone else's? That's, that's my personal view, yes. That's why I'm personally not suitable um, as a member of your committee, and I wouldn't like to embarrass the committee by making a statement somewhere which would be in conflict with the neutrality of your committee. Thank you, David. Any other members? Okay, thank you for that. We have the minute of the last meeting. Is that a, a, an accurate record? Thank you. Okay. Nick, can you just uh, go through the process for today, please, or the procedure for today? Uh, thanks, Chair. The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The Chair has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in Council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The Chair will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application, third parties supporting an application, statutory consultees objecting to an application, elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee. Such members should withdraw from the committee chamber after making their presentation. Applicants or their agents. <coughs> Representatives have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person except in for national and major developments, which by their very nature are more complex, where the time limit will be five minutes. The Chair will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representatives are encouraged <coughs> to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally material planning consideration and will be and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. Representatives should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report as members will have already read the reports. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application or, where appropriate, agree a recommendation to be made to full council who will determine the application. Thank you, Nick. We now move on to agenda item 
four, which is a continuation. Uh, Archie. Thanks, Gerard. I'm just presuming that since I wasn't at the last area committee, that I can't be involved in the determination of this application because there was a site visit. The site visit is no re uh, relevance because you can determine that this application whether or not, but I was just going to get Nick to redo the names of the members who yeah. will be able to determine yeah. this application. Can you just do that now, Nick, please? Thanks, Chair. Yes, for clarification, the members who can um, participate and determine this um, application are Councillors Dempster, John Campbell, Ian Blake, Doogie Fairburn, Andy Ferguson, Andrew Juicy, Katie Hagman, Ivor Hislop, Jeff Lever, Jane Maitland, John Martin, Jim McComb, David McKee, Elaine Murray, Ronnie Tate and John Young. Thank you. John Martin. I think I missed that because I had to go to I had an uh, appointment at the hospital. Then you're okay. Well, it'll be your decision whether or not you participate no. in the decision making, so you're not going to. No. You can delete John Martin from that list, please. Hey, and, and we had a site visit yesterday, thanks to the applicant and the agent uh, and the objectors for being present. That helped us during the, the visit. And if we can have a slide just to remind us, it should be Toro Glendinning. She's uh, on another council business today. So David will take us through the slides just to remind members and I think Kate will maybe introduce a, a, a scheme of closing the curtains to allow members of the public and members to see better the images that are displayed on the on the wall. Then we'll open them again when we get into session. So just briefly, can we just close the curtains, Paul, please? And then I'll ask David to take us through the, the slides relating to agenda item four. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is uh, subject to the, the visit that took place yesterday, so it's just a, a refresher of the slides. That's the location plan to show the context of the site. Uh, the large development to the, the north is the Gretna Gateway Outlet Centre. So the application site itself comprises the petrol filling station, the workshop for the garage MOT centre, and also a dwelling house, which is... Uh, pretty much in the centre of that slide here, with the back garden there at the moment. And this is the proposed block plan, so the car parking would then become formalised around here, including into the, the rear garden, and what is presently the dwelling house would become the cafe. There's a couple of minor other parts of the development under the, the canopy here. There would be a 24-hour payment uh, module and then here where there's presently a porta cabin that would become a car wash which we understand would be actually be a hand car wash rather than a rollover type that's the existing dwelling house at the moment and then this is the proposed layout as was discussed on site yesterday the the main entrance the public entrance would be to the front uh, from the, the main forecourt with the parking coming down here, there would, however, be an area here where it could be possible for people to come in the, the back as well. The intention of the operator is for these six new spaces to the rear really to be used by staff members rather than the public. And you can see the logic to that. People will be more inclined to park along here where they can see the clear entrance. And that would be a, a less obvious entrance to the rear. And the proposed elevations, fairly minor changes to the, the property itself. Probably the most obvious bit is on the gable end, there'll be a window installed here. This is the payment column, which would be under the, the main petrofilling station. And then just the, the slides to show the same. So it's looking down into the site with the, the house in the centre and the MOT station immediately adjoining it. And the, the access would be round to the rear here the garden. View from the outlet centre. View up towards the roundabout. View down from the roundabout down Glasgow Road and that's the main entrance. Members might note there were comments uh, from roads officers about the tactile surfacing and I can appreciate the comments they're making where if that was put in here there's no obvious part where anybody who's visually impaired would follow a logic, logical uh, route so I think we do need to have some details of that, and that's covered by condition. 
At the moment, the, the current car parking arrangement is the, the vehicle recovery cars park right along here, uh, right with the, the boundary to the rear. And the applicant's uh, representative yesterday was saying that their intention is to try and find a, another location for those so they wouldn't be on site any longer. A photo. And that's the existing filling station and car wash. I'm looking towards the, the porter cabin here, which would be removed, and the, the new car wash would be installed there. Looking in front of the house, that's the, the house pull on. So the main entrance to the public would actually be created in, in this section here. Just looking to around to the, the rear garden is number 15, where the representatives were present yesterday. So obviously at the moment, they, they are rear garden just about to another rear garden, but there's a, a solid timber wall fence, sorry, of uh, about 1.8 metres. And that's existing rear garden, which would be formed into car parking spaces. There would be a, a bin store located in here with a, a new fence running along there. And then this is looking at uh, Sarkfoot Road, where the existing port cabin would be removed and a new car wash would be installed at that location. So there's a, a reasonable separation distance that you can see between here and the next nearest property. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, David. Paul, can you open the curtains again, please? Okay, members, we're in session. John Young. Yes, th thank you, Chair. I found the site visit very useful yesterday. And I know it says on page 13 that the recovery vehicles that are present located at the back of this um, garage area will be relocated. Is it possible to make that a condition so that they are, are, are definitely located away from this site? David? <laughs> Whilst I would like to say yes, I don't think we could actually enforce it. It's obviously an existing authorised use at the moment. We clearly heard from the, the applicant, applicant's uh, representative yesterday that they were wanting to do that, but it's not something I think we could competently attach as a planning condition, I'm afraid. Okay, John A. Okay, F. Uh, Ian, Ian Blake. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I too had kind of several concerns about that. I was there about 30 minutes early yesterday and saw how busy, it was really surprisingly busy how site that is. A lot of cars are there, permanently parked, and the breakdown vehicles, and with the introduction of a cafe, you would assume that that would even give further traffic into it. So I have some concerns about that. I, th I could see if, if the breakdown vehicles are relocated, uh, and there are quite a number of them, it would certainly free up a good bit of parking. Uh, but I appreciate what David says about it can't be a condition. My other concern was the the position of the or the proposed position of the second car wash. Uh, I appreciate it's a hand wash, but it is a generator that runs when that when that is on. And that being a new car wash, I'd like to ask David's opinion if a condition could be put on that with the hours of operation for that, because it's although you said it's a fair separation distance from the the houses opposite, I don't personally agree with that. I think it's fairly close for. Uh, that type of car wash. Thanks for that, Ian. Can we place a condition on the hours that can be applied for the new or, or can be introduced for the new car hand wash car, car wash, Dave, please? In a word, yes, I think you could. Um, 4.7 in the report sets out the issues about noise and it does refer to the fact that environmental health have legislative powers to require business to address these matters. So that's probably the, the proper authority to deal with that if there was found to be an accept, unacceptable noise level. But in terms of hours of operation, that's a slightly different matter. Um, yes, I think that would be quite competent for you to touch that. Um, obviously, I'd be guided by members to what reasonable hours would be. But the petrol filling station itself um, operates 24 hours a day. So it's whether or not it's, it's reasonable to require the, the car wash to, to be restricted unduly. I would suggest if you've got the, the hours of the cafe being proposed as 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., that probably is a, a ready reckoner for it as well. Okay. Uh, after uh, John Young. 
Uh, thank you. I think we're back in chair, and I think I probably know what the answer is, but I'll, I'll try anyway. The, the six rear newly created parking spaces, is it possible to have them labelled staff parking, and that will minimise the movement of vehicles during the day? David? I think that would actually help. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to require that simply because the the spaces are going to be for general use, but if we could ask for them to, to be marked as uh, preference, preferably for um, for staff, I agree that would prevent the coming and going all day. Um, so I'm sure we could come up with a, some wording that would would just require it to be for for staff only. Thanks, John Andy. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, living right next door to another hand car wash, I totally agree about the restriction on hours if that's the route were to go down. Um, eight o'clock on a Monday to Friday is fine because it's an alarm clock. Saturday and Sunday, I would suggest it's uh, it's um, antisocial because. Um, uh, the difference between the 24-hour petrol station coming in and using their car than everything else and the, the noise from the car wash is like night and day. Uh, and uh, I, I'd be supportive of putting um, quite a stringent time thing on the, at the weekend, particularly. Uh, it would appear that members are inclined to agree the recommendation with one or two amendments or, or conditions being attached. And you will remember David saying we can't kind of be too draconian in the condition. And I think the other thing is we're conditioned. We have to be able to enforce them eh, or, or it's no reasonable. But can you maybe help members, David, with, and if it seems we're able, willing to agree this a eh, eh, request with the two additional recommendations, David, or, or conditions, can you help members with what they might sound like, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, I think in respect of the car parking spaces, you would be saying that the, the six new car parking spaces to the, the rear of the, the cafe, to the south side of the cafe, um, should be for use of staff only uh, and shall be signed accordingly. For the hours of operation, um, again, it would be along the lines that the, the new car wash here by granted planning permission shall not operate out with the hours of um, so again, I'll go back to Councillor Ferguson to see what you were suggesting. Was it eight till six or something like that? Uh, uh, weekdays, on, on and, weekdays. Then, and, and then maybe ten till four or something at the weekends because the noise is really quite bad. Uh, hindsight is wonderful, right, isn't it? You know, but because if, if we don't do it now, um, I would suggest uh, we we're just um, put a, you know building up a case that, that the noise here is terrible and there might be complaints all over the place. So um, I think that's where I would be wanting to go. Some some doing those lines um, quite restricted at the, at the weekend. I wouldn't have wanted it to become a bidding war, but somebody wants five, one wants half past five. But I think we have to be reasonable in as much as it, it, it's a, an opportunity to enhance the business opportunities for the company. And it's also availability of folk at weekends being able to go and wash their cars. So we have to be reasonable with it. David McKee. I think I think the big the biggest issue would be the noise generated by the car wash. Um, could we put a limit on that? That, that would need to be worked out, obviously. But I, don't, I don't know how noisy they are, but that might that might be a way of restricting it. But can five five, five o'clock in, in the day is kind of early for stopping that because a lot of people work during the day. Weekends. <laughs> I, th I think it's been said that the only uh, noise would be a generator, and some of these generators are very, very quiet nowadays, and it would be a, an environmental standards issue anyway, noise enforcement, if it were to breach any particular noise enforcement uh, uh, position or condition. But can we just try and get a, re without spending all day on this, can we just try and get a reasonable set of hours for through the week and weekend that would fit the business, help support the business, uh, and no disturb the the local residents. David, can you come up with a suggestion, please? Well, I think taking on board uh, the comments I've heard, I would suggest weekdays 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and weekends. I, personally, I don't think 9 to 5 is unreasonable um, because, as has been pointed out, many people work at the weekends as well and don't work during the week. 
I've got Elaine, and then hopefully we can come to a conclusion. Yeah, I was just going Elaine to, and then Ronnie. Yeah, I'm just going to suggest actually that it's probably the morning hours that are most disturbing, rather than the the afternoon. You know, it's be people being woken up. Uh, so I was just going to suggest that I say make it ten till six or something, so you give people a bit of time on the Sunday to, you know, if they are working to be able to go and wash their car. But I don't think many people will be going to bed at six o'clock on a Sunday night, really. So. Uh, no, that, that was just my suggestion. Okay, Elaine Ronnie. Chair, thanks, Chair. I mean, as a business point of view, I think if you were cutting the car wash off at 6 o'clock at night, like I think most people wash their cars after that. And there's a lot of people use car washes after 6 o'clock at night. As Mr. McKee said, right, you know, you can, there's people working all day. So I think 6 o'clock at night is a really early cutoff point. Remember, there's an existing car wash that's got 24 hour use. Hey, this is only an ancillary one, and it's possible that folk still take advantage of their one. And that's why I didn't want to get into a long, protracted debate about ours. We can just get something reasonable, and the, the applicant, if he or she finds that it's a particularly busy and popular a, a feature of their business, they can come back for varying in that condition, can't they, David? Yeah. So, members, can we go with the suggestion that we'll manage to get around the houses that Saturday and Sunday is different, 10 o'clock start in the morning, maybe it's 6 at night, and through the week it would be, David? 8 to 6 through the week. Members content with that? And the, 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 the marking up with the car parking spaces for staff only. Members content and go with the recommendation on that basis? Thanks, members. Thank you very much. We come to agenda item number 5. It's a, a, a planning and principal application for erection of eight holiday lodges and associated infrastructure at Ochendoon House, Conifer's Leisure Park, Kirk Tree, Minigaff, Newton Stewart. That's a planning application principle. The reference number is 18 stroke 1082 stroke PIP. The recommendation is to approve subject conditions and the case officer is Mary Mitchell. Mary, when you're ready, oh, just give a minute to shut the curtain, please, and then take us through your presentation. Pete, Paul, can you shut the curtain, please? Okay, um, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is an application, an in-principle application for the erection of eight holiday lodges. The layout of the site and the design of the lodges will be subject to a further planning application. Um, the proposal forms an extension to the existing holiday park at Conifer's Leisure Park. Uh, this application has been brought to committee as seven separate and timeous third party objections have been received. The objections are from uh, neighbouring dwelling houses um, and they raise immunity concerns in the main um, issues about uh, increased noise and increased traffic. We'll look at the slides. <coughs> So uh, Conifers is, ju is located just to the north of uh, the Newton Stewart settlement boundary. No. That's the site up there, and the existing uh, Conifers Park is here. It's a close up. Again, the site is here, and existing Conifers uh, chalets are here. Um, this is a hotel, um, they were one of the objectors, um, and these are dwelling houses up here. Um, that's a block of flats, so, and there's a house down there as well, that one's Galloway Lodge, which is probably the closest house to the uh, development. So um, on site at the moment there is uh, uh, an equestrian centre, which hasn't been used for quite a while. Um, the proposal is to remove the equestrian centre. That's this building here. There's also a house here, which is owned and occupied by the manager of Conifer's Leisure Park. This is uh, an indicative layout. Um, so the existing driveway would be used down here. Um, uh, and uh, four lodges this side, four lodges that side, a pond in the middle and the house would be retained there. Um, all the way around the site, there is um, a high brick wall. It's about four metres in height, um, and it would be retained as part of the development. 
these are layouts of the, the lodges. There are to be two lodges with two bedrooms, like this one. And six lodges with just a single bedroom, like this. Um, they both have a decking area and a, a hot tub at the, um, just down here. Uh, so this is um, looking up the driveway towards the site. This is part of the high brick wall. You can see the, uh, the old equestrian centre to the left, and to the right was the dwelling house I pointed out, um, Galloway Lodge. That's the roof of Galloway Lodge. This was one of the objectors. <coughs> the old equestrian centre. Uh, Ochendun House, which is to remain. Part of the paddock area on the site. Ochendun House uh, looking east. <coughs> Oops. More paddock. Paddock. Um, this is the, uh, the west elevation of the equestrian centre. And just to the right of that photo is Ochendun House. This is the, the rear um, north elevation of the equestrian centre. The brick wall is just to the left in all that foliage. Um, the southwest corner of the site, showing a corner of the brick wall. Parts of the brick wall are a wee bit fallen down, but um, there's a, a condition on the um, report to say it would be repaired and retained. Oops. This is the, uh, the east boundary wall. There's a nice sort of round feature in it, blocked up. Um, so I'm outside the site now, and this is looking at the northern boundary wall <coughs> from outside the site. Um, the western boundary wall from outside the site. This is from Conifer's Leisure Park. So inside Conifer's Leisure Park again, <clears throat> looking at the western side of the boundary wall, southwest corner of the boundary wall, and this is us back at the start again. Uh, you can see um, Galloway Lodge just behind that uh, timber lodge in the background. So um, it's considered that the amenity concerns raised are not attributed to the uh, the proposed land use but rather to the behaviour of the guests at Conifers, which is a police issue and not a planning issue. Uh, the retention of the, bound, of the brick boundary wall uh, will act as an effective and additional barrier and screen between the proposed lodges and the adjacent dwelling houses. There should be no reduced residential amenity as a result of this development. The site is accessed by a network of private roads. Uh, road services have raised no objections to the proposal and have equated the traffic generated by the proposed use to the traffic formally created by the equestrian centre, which is to be demolished. The application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Mary. Paul, could you open the curtains again, please? Members, questions for the case officer, bearing in mind it's a planning application in principle only. Andy? Um, just to clear something up, the paddocks, are they considered green space under the new... Proposals for LDP2. Mary? Well, I asked David. Um, it's, uh, I, I don't know what, what it, I, I don't think it has a specific designation in LDP2. Um, I'll get David to do it, Mary. Yeah, correct. It's basically it's not identified as open space, it's just private land. For any use? So it's available for anything, David, is that what you're saying? It's out with the settlement boundary for Newton Stewart, so it's just countryside area, basically. Okay, other questions for the case officer, David McKee? There was one picture he showed there where the house outside the, the boundary wall seemed to be high up. Is the ground quite elevated out there <coughs> in places? Really? Um, I'll flick back. Um, the site itself is level. 
Um, was, was it that one? No? Yeah, um, no, it's, it's pretty um, the immediately adjacent to the site. It's all, it's all about the same level. The, um, looking at this one, the site, the land does fall. It does fall down this way, but the, the slope is all around this area, really. This part here is all pretty much of the same, same level. It rises a bit more over here. It's but the site itself and immediately adjacent to the site is pretty much the same height. <coughs> it's probably just the design of the house that makes it look uh, higher in the wall, but that's fine, thanks. Maybe. Thanks, Mary. Uh, if there are no other questions for the case office, sir, we have Ms Laura Hepburn, who is the applicant. Laura, if you'd like to just come forward, please, and, and take a seat. You will have uh, three minutes to make a presentation to committee members. I'd be grateful if you'd remain in your seat in case there are questions for you. And I will remind you with 30 seconds to go just to draw your presentation to a conclusion. And just whenever you're ready, Laura. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for get, giving me the opportunity just to kind of add or clarify a couple of points, which I think, um, you know, regarding our um, application for eight lodges. So just to kind of give you a bit of a background into the, the site in general, we bought Conifer's Leisure Park in 2012 when it was in really a poor state of affairs in administration um, and was just, the disrepair across the site was just that it, it wasn't functioning as a holiday park. So since 2012, we've taken on the park and refurbished every lodge um, to a high standard um, and, and kind of turned a failing business into something that's really, quite, you know, evidently a highly sought after holiday destination. Um, as part of the refurbishment that we have done to date um, from 2012, 2012, we've spent over 1.6 million on local tradesmen and suppliers in the Newton Stewart um, and Wigtonshire area. So everything that we are doing um, it is kind of going back into our local community. We're not searching the length and breadth of the UK for cheapest suppliers or, or contractors. We are making a real point um, and a pushed effort in making sure that everything that we are spending is within the, the local community and that will continue. Um, the area of Wigtonshire that we are in has quite a high unemployment rate um, and it has, faces the challenges of being a, you know, an ageing and declining population. Since 2012, we've employed 39 members of staff on site. Currently, I have 19 full-time members of staff and nine bank and relief staff, all of which we've taken on um, and everyone is trained up. So I think just from that point of view, we're adding what we're doing back into the, the local community. Um, Dumfries and Galloway, you know, it's, it's in so many reports whether it's Scottish Government Council visit Scotland that tourism is key to this area just to kind of help the area prosper. And that is something that we are obviously keen to support and, and carry on. The guests that come and stay with us, come and stay, yes, and obviously that's that's great for us, but they also visit attractions and, and tourist spots in the local community across the whole region. So it's not just restricted to us having um, that volume of people here for us. We encourage you know, the, the, them to out and explore the area, which again, by adding the eight additional lodges on, it gives us further further people within us, um, within our remit to kind of push out. So we purchased Auchindoon in January of 2008 this year. Um, with always you have 30 the, seconds to go, Lord. Always being the intention of repairing the brick wall um, and, you know, maintaining that site, taking down an almost derelict building, which will in time need significant repairs. Um, and lastly, we fully take on board the objections that have come in, but feel that the response that I've provided in, in Mary's report has kind of covered what are not planning issues in our civil matters. Thank you. Bang on, Laura. Thank you very much. Members, do we, any questions for the applicant? Jane Maitland. Um, <clears throat> hello. Hi. There is a condition um, in the um, recommendation which, if we were to approve, would be probably part and parcel of the decision. Um, how do you... Um, enforce the condition that it will only be used as a temporary and holiday basis? How, how do you do that? We, we just do not take any bookings. We have a maximum. Guests cannot book anything longer than 14 days. Um, 
without you know without contacting us they could go on our website they could book um but we just have a very strict policy the, the previous owners of the park had in fact used things like insurance for if someone was perhaps getting insurance around their house and they found that it didn't work guests were very hard to move on so we've always had a strict policy on all of our properties we have other sites across scotland and it's just our down and out principle that we take holiday makers and that is the sole purpose nothing else will ever be considered Thank you, Jane. Any other questions for the applicant, Archie? Can you just clarify um, the amount of staff? Did you say 19 full-time and 9 reliefs? Yes. And it, was it, was it, did you say 29 or 39 jobs? 39 since 2012, since we bought the park. So we've had a lot of seasonal workers on over summer, um, students home from university oh, and things you. like that. Yeah. Thanks, Archie. Any other members? Uh, John, uh, John Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Laura, for your presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Condition 10. It says that the, there should be sufficient hard standing for two cars mm -hmm. for each of the unit. That's 16 cars. How often do you think the, the changeover will be? I, I would presume uh, some people will book it for the weekend, some people will book it through the week. So uh, just to try and get a, an idea of the turnover of yeah, vehicles. It, it can really vary. Um, over the summer peak months, um, we have minimum stays in place of um, a four-night minimum. The rest of the year, we're a two-night minimum. Um, we offer any day start date. So our changeover days are very, very staggered. They're not like some holiday parks where everything happens on a Friday, everything happens on a Monday. It's spread over a seven-day period because we offer that two-day, any start day, you know, sort of start and stop of the holiday. So there's, there's no specific day where we see huge amounts because it is spread throughout. So yes, there would be 16 cars potentially at one time, but the likelihood is they would be coming and changing over at different periods throughout the week, just the way we stagger our breaks. Thanks, John. Any other questions for the applicant? In that case, Laura, thank you for your presentation. Just please resume your seat. Members are now in session. Archie. Thanks, Chair. I think this, this one is, is, is one where we want to encourage development and um, in the Wigtonshire area, and, and I would I would suggest that we go with the recommendations on this one, Chair. Thanks, Archie. Katie. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I would just reiterate those points, and I would say that um, Laura has quite rightly pointed out Newton Stewart and the area does really require lots of input for tourism. It's a wonderful place. I'm obviously representing that ward and any development I would actually welcome within the area. So, yes, I would be happy to second the approval of the application. Thanks for that, Katie. Ian? Yeah, I'm much of the, the same view. I've known this area, well, it was ACE Equestrian Centre, I think it was, in the 1980s, and it was fairly run down then. Uh, but uh, I welcome the, the development. I think it's an excellent opportunity. It would seem then, members, this is a unanimous decision. And no alternative views. Nick, can you confirm the decision of members, please? Uh, yes, Chair. The um, the decision is to approve the application as per the recommendations and conditions in the report. <laughs> Must be Dougie coming in. <laughs> 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 you just do get a minute to get settled. Members, we come to agenda item number six planning application for the erection of three dwelling houses at Old Tennis Court, Ball Play Road, Moffat. Again, this is a planning permission and principal application. The application number is reference 18 stroke 0932 stroke PIP. The recommendation is to approve subject to the successful completion of legal agreement in respect of an educational contribution within six months of the date of the decision or any extended time scale as agreed by the appointed officer and B conditions. And the case officer is clear the next time. Again, Paul, will you shut the curtains, please? And Claire, when you're ready, just take us through your presentation. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, this application is plan for planning permission in principle for uh, three dwelling houses. Uh, the site um, 
relates to the tennis courts and pavilion that, that formed part of the ball play uh, uh, tennis club on the north side of uh, ball play road in Moffat. Uh, the plan uh, here shows the application site but also shows uh, the location of Beach Grove Sports Centre, which is referred to in, in the report, which is the, the location of the other, other tennis courts uh, within Moffat. This shows the, this block plan uh, shows the, the three house plots um, and the proposed two accesses. This is the application site boundary. Uh, it was amended to include the uh, pavilion uh, and also the, the, the site frontage to that allow the accesses to be formed. And this is just an aerial photograph just showing where the application site is. So this is the entrance to the site, uh, looking east uh, along Ball Play Road, and it shows the existing site access uh, to the, the former tennis courts and to the adjoining property at Silver Dean. And this is looking from the other way um, with the the car showing uh, the entrance to the gate uh, to Silver Dean, and this is looking towards Well Road. Um, so this is the entrance to the site itself, uh, with Silver Dean to the left, and this is the old uh, pavilion building. So this is from the southwest corner of the site. So we're looking across the old tennis courts uh, from across the access road into to Silver Dean. And again, this is another showing the old tennis courts, which you can see are uh, now in a rather disused and dilapidated condition. <laughs> and this is looking across um, uh, the, the, the tennis courts, uh, the old tennis courts, I should say, uh, towards, the, um, towards the field, which is part of MOF um, H4, which is the, the large identified housing site for Moffat. And this is panning right uh, from the previous photograph. I've highlighted just the position of the old pavilion building. Uh, and that's us. So a detailed assessment of the proposal is set out uh, in the report. The, uh, the main issue relates to the development of housing uh, on these disused tennis courts that were identified, were ident are identified as uh, open space in the local plan. However, note, as noted um, in detail in paragraphs 4.5 and 4.6 of the report, um, suitable justification has been provided to meet with the policy uh, CF3A. The private tennis club uh, no longer exists uh, and, the ten and, and the courts have fallen into disrepair. Um, the proposal has raised no objections from Scotland uh, who recognise um, from Tennis Scotland's advice that given the recent funding and significant improvements of the Beach Grove uh, Sports Centre in Moffat, that they do not consider that there is a detriment to the overall playing capacity in Moffat through the loss of these, uh, this site. It is con therefore considered subject to the conditions uh, noted in the report and the other issues um, raised relating to the road safety access, servicing, landscaping um, are addressed with our address and with the legal agreement um, which will provide for developer contribution, contributions it meets with the planning policies and the proposal is recommended for approval as detailed in the report. Thank you Claire. Paul Kiltnikart again please. And members, questions for case officer? Katie? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just looking on the map we've got in front of it. We seem to, we've got the water that runs adjacent to the site. Is there any issue with flooding or anything from that point of view? Clear. No, if you, sorry, if you see the, uh, there's a response back from, uh, in paragraph 2.2, uh, where the flood risk management team raised no objections. Uh, they have asked for a um, directive well, we can add that as an advisory, um, given the advice which can be added as a directive. Okay, Katie. Other questions for the case officer? None? Okay. We have a registered speaker. We have uh, Melvin Stewart on behalf of the applicant. Melvin, if you'd like to come forward, please. 
Again, Melvin, you'll have three minutes. I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go. Just try a presentation to a conclusion. And if you kindly wait in case members have questions for you. And just whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you. Uh, morning. Before I uh, start, uh, apologies for our agent, Susie. It's had uh, quite a vase of uh, dental surgery last week and finding it difficult to speak, so it's quite handy that she keeps quiet. <laughs> Sorry. No. We fully endorse all the comments made by the planning officer in her report, Part 4, and find the conditions acceptable in Part 5. As this is a planning and principal application only, we are happy to work with the planning to ensure the type of uh, housing are in keeping with the neighbourhood properties surrounding in the surrounding area. The Bopley Lawn Tennis Court Committee made a serious attempt to continue playing tennis and the courts and meeting the terms as outlined in its constitution. Following the committee's unsuccessful application to the planning, they looked at the sharing their, the sharing their facilities with other clubs, particularly at five-a-side football games. However, the, the facilities, uh, the netting and the surfaces would have been not suitable for the playing of these games. Uh, the French Bulls Club approached the committee with an idea of using the courts as an international ground, despite already having a site and a grant to occupy a site down at the uh, station park, but they had no business plan to back this up. The Astronomy Club made no approach to the committee, and it is believed that they had a plan to use the site available at the Moffat Golf Club, given the expense Oh, sorry, given the expense conditions of the playing surface and ensuring the club constitution were being met, there was no possibility of the courts being used for any other sport than tennis. The committee, the club, and the club endeavoured to attract new members. While the neighbouring households were happy for the club to be existing there, there was no interest amongst them to become members. Therefore, due to lack of members, very little money, poor playing surface and lines, there was no alternative but to put the grounds up for sale. As per the club constitution, money from the sale was given to the Moffat, benefit of Moffat. The grounds included courts and the pavilion were offered for sale at a public auction and all interested parties were informed. You have 30 seconds to go, Mel. A significant amount of the money was proceeded processed and donated to the Beach Grove Tennis Court, which had grown in popularity and uh, helped towards all the uh, all weather playing surface, which would satisfy all Moffat's tennis interests. We did not want to go over again what was said in our supporting statement, but we wanted to give you more information on why the club had to be wound up and the land sold. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for the applicant? John, John yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you for that background. Very useful. I'm just wondering about the existing um, pavilion. Now it will have light and it will have toilets and it's going to be part of the cartilage of the, the third bungalow. It, it would be an ideal granny flat. Uh, is there, have you any thoughts regarding how it will be used? Uh, well, not at the moment, no. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, really... It would be an ideal granny flat, yeah, but uh, I think if it was incorporated in one of the sites, it might be, you know, whoever develops that site would uh, maybe use it, use it as a granny flat or, or, you know, produce one. Sorry, I'm not very clear about that. Thanks, John. Any other questions for the applicant? In that case, if you'd like to resume your seats, please. Thank you very much Thank for your you. presentation. Members were in session. Jeff and then Jane. Hi, <laughs> you're not that good looking. It was you, I man, Archie. Yeah, you're not that good looking either yourself, man. <laughs> uh, must be a shank, I think, you talk about um, how people look in planning as opposed to a... That may be a good one because he looks very good. Yeah, not happening. <laughs> hey, Jim. I, I, think, I think in this case, they've tried everything they can to, to move the um, courts forward. I think looking at the uh, report itself, 
Uh, and obviously the, the benefits of what's happening in other areas of Moffat with the tennis club and things like that, I think in this case we should go with the recommendations. Okay, if Jane and then Elaine. Um, <coughs> Chairman, um, I looked at this and, and thought to myself actually that I think we must have miscalled this uh, item of land in the LDP because um, it's not protected open area, open space. I mean, there is a very distinct difference between a sports facility and a protected area of open space, um, which actually Sports Scotland makes quite clear in their consultation response too. They have absolutely no locus in discussing whether or not they should be considering the um, saving of open space. All they're interested in is sports facilities. Now, they've told us that they can uh, see their way to removing the sports facilities, that's not a problem. But um, it's up to us then to think about this in, re in respect of our designation of this land as open space. So if we're being completely purist, actually, I don't know that we've necessarily jumped through the hoops which says that this is to be removed as an area of open space, I would suggest to you. I simply put that there as the debate at the moment. Thanks, Jane. If you have an alternative proposal, I'll get it from you before the session is concluded. Elaine. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, the paper refers to a representation from a local MSP who has a constituency office in Lockerbie, and I'm cl clearly I'm totally unable to identify who that individual might happen to be. But in this particular circumstances, I very much agree with his uh, suggestions, and I am happy to uh, second Archie's proposal that we, we approve the recommendation. Okay, thanks then. So we have a motion and a second or two ago with the office recommendation. Jane has expressed a degree of concern. Do you have a view, Jane? Well, I do. And uh, if, if through you, might I ask for um, an explanation from our officers as to um, what, 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 what the designation is as opposed to simply being a sports facility? David, can you help Jane? I can try. Um, basically, the site would have been identified because it was a sports facility and therefore open space. It's not open space in the sense that it is a, an open park or something like that. But I think one of the critical things here, I, I wouldn't entirely disagree with your comment that it's been perhaps misidentified in the LDP because it is a private facility. It's never been a public open space. Um, I think we've taken on board that in coming to the recommendation here and recognised especially that the clincher for me, if you like, was the Sports Scotland comments. Normally, Sports Scotland are, are very again the loss of any open space and uh, playing facilities. Where they've been supportive here, I think that demonstrates that Moffat has an ample sufficiency with the, the tennis courts that it has just had refurbished. But as for the original reason why it was identified, sorry, I can't give you any more information than that. Content with that, Jane? I'm content with that. Thank you. Do you want to come back and answer or we're finished? Okay. We have a, a, a motion and an amendment. It would appear if there are no alternative proposals. It's a unanimous decision. Can you confirm the decision of the committee, Nick, please? Yes, just to, clar just to clarify that the decision is to approve the application as per the recommendations in the report. Thanks, Nick. We come to agenda item uh, number seven. A, an application for the erection of two dwelling houses at Greenacre Moosel. The application type again is planning for mission in principle. The recommendation is to approve conditionally. The reference number is 18 stroke 0978 stroke PIP. And the case officer is Carla McQuinney. Carla, okay, the curtain shut again, Paul, and just take us through your presentation, Carla, please. Thank you, Chair. The application is for planning permission in principle for two, for the direction of two dwelling houses within the cartilage of Green Acre, which is within the Moosel Place Small Building Group. In the local, uh, the location plan, you can see that um, the Small Building Group is to the northwest of Moosel.
second slide shows the application site Greenacre is highlighted. Um, and you can see the site in comparison to with the rest of the small building group. The application is highlighted, um, it's a red hatched area. The, the orchard and the pines are located between the application sites and, um, sorry, the, um, it, within the application, sorry, sorry again. Within this location plan, you can see um, part of Moosled Lodge Caravan Park, then the orchard and the pines, which are two dwelling houses um, located um, between the application site and Greenacre. Itself. It shows the, the site plan as existing. And this is the proposed indicative site plan. The proposed indicative site plan sh um, shows um, the, a uh, the, the layout of the application site. Um, please note that condition three limits the footprint of the, both the dwellings to 125 square metres. And by comparison, Green Acre is approximately 125 square metres. This shows the entrance to the, the entrance road, which serves both the dwelling house and the Mus Musil Lodge Caravan Park. This shows the existing access to Green Acre. This shows the side elevation of Green Acre and looks across the application site. Um, and you can see the dwelling house, the orchard, um, beyond the application site. And we continue on. This looks across the application site and you can clearly see the side, um, the rear elevation of um, the orchard. Pan and right, you can see the orchard and you can see the application site is currently quite overgrown and uneven. This shows the rear elevation of the, um, the pines. Oh, sorry, the roof of the, the rear roof plane of the pines. This looks southwest across the application site. Um, you can see part, um, you can see um, there's like a, a large um, bush and you can see a little um, part of the orchard and again part of the rear elevation of um, the rear roof plane of the pines. This looks northwest towards the point of um, the proposed entrance site, which is to the left of the existing entrance site. Um, this would involve um, partial removal of the wall, the existing boundary wall. And this um, is looking back towards um, Greenacre. Um, you can see from the photograph that the the height of the, um, the ground level changes throughout the application site. It slopes downwards from Green Acre towards neighbouring dwellings, the orchard and the pines. The proposal is not considered to constitute, constitute backland development due to the existing pattern of development within the immediate area. Um, limiting the footprint and preventing attic accommodation by condition is considered to mitigate the potential negative impact of the, um, the two dwelling houses on both the orchard, the pines, and um, Green Acre itself. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Paul, can you open the curtain again, please? Members, questions for case officer? John Young. Thank you for that presentation. Could you confirm that the proposed access road to these two potential new dwelling houses is the same access as that used by the caravan site? Yes. Thank you, Any other questions? There are no registered speakers. Members, therefore, are in session. Archie? Thanks very much, Chair. I mean, we've seen this area before. Come, come forward to... Um, Planning Applications Committee, and although I don't have a lot of concern about this, this application it is planning permission in principle. Uh, I do have some concern about the uh, off run of some of the, the, the land water and things like that, although there are, there are issues the, within the, the report that the, for the roads officer are, 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 have said that they have no, no issue with. However, we have in the past in planning permission asked that the full application comes back to Planning Applications Committee. 
and I would like to see, as a, as a condition of going forward with this approval, uh, that the full application comes back to uh, Planning Applications Committee, because I am just a little bit concerned about off-run and things like that from, from flooding issues. The other, other alternative, of course, is, is, is to place that as a condition on the, 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 any approval that might be given, but I'm in your hands, Archie. Hey, that's a proposal, members, from a, a member of the committee that this report or well, this application, when it is a full application, goes back before members. Is that what members want to see? Yeah? Okay. So, on that basis, actually, are you proposing that we agree this a, a recommendation, officer recommendation, with the additional condition that is presented to the committee as a full application in due course? David? Sorry, can I just clarify, Chair? You couldn't competently attach a condition requiring it to come back to committee, but you could note as we've done previously in the, the committee minute, that any future application has to come back to yourself. I'm happy Thanks for that, that clarity. Yeah. Happy with that. Absolutely okay. It's a unanimous decision in members uh, to approve this application. Nick, can you just confirm the decision of the committee, please, and with it noting that it will come back. Uh, yes, Chair. The, the um, decision is to agree the application um, subject to the um, recommendations and the conditions set out in the report, and additionally, noting that when the application comes back um, as a full application, it will come back to um, Planning Applications Committee. Thank you, Nick. We move on to agenda <laughs> item number eight, erection of detached domestic garage, tractor shed and bridge at Nursery Cottage, Dumfries Road, Tobite. This is a full application. The reference number is 18 stroke 1240 stroke full. The recommendation is to refuse and the case officer is clear cut. Again, Paul, can you shut the curtains, please? Sorry I didn't get you back, John. Uh, and, uh, hello there. <laughs> Jessica, again. I'll get you right one of these days, Jessica. Keep up, uh, case officer today, Jessica Taylor. Jessica, again, when you're ready, please just take us through the presentation. Uh, so Nursery Cottage is located on the north edge of Dalbeti along the A711. Um, the proposed development consists of a garage to the northern edge of the site, um, a tractor shed to the east, and to the south uh, of the dwelling house, a proposed bridge. So this is uh, the design of the uh, garage. It's typical in construction and, and scale. Um, it's a rough cast render under grey slate roof. Again, a, the tractor shed um, is typical of an agricultural style building with um, profile sheeting and juniper green. And these are details of the bridge which will be a timber construction. So just looking at the site, so this is looking at the proposed location of the garage to the <laughs> northern boundary. So again, looking at the, where the proposed garage will be. And this is the location of the proposed tractor shed against the backdrop of the, the trees behind. And again, the tractor shed location. And the proposed location of, of the bridge. And this is just looking at the site from the public road. <coughs> um, as detailed in the report, the issue that has arisen with this application relates to the potential flooding. In 2014, a plan application was granted for the removal of two railway embankments, um, which one was to the right of the dwelling where the tractor shed uh, is proposed. Uh, essentially, this is flattening the site, as you saw in the photographs uh, before. Um, this has created a new floodplain, which at the time was supported by SEPA, um, but now we have to look at it with the development that is now within the floodplain and the impacts of that. Um, so SEPA have raised an objection because they consider there is insufficient information being submitted with the application to consider the Im impacts of the potential flooding of the site uh, following the removal of the embankments and the impacts the proposed garage and tractor shed would have on the floodplain. The applicant has been asked for the, the information to be provided and some has, but SEPA don't consider it sufficient to um, take away their objection. So based on the lack of information that we have in uh, the objection from SEPA and also the objection from the Council's flood risk team, the application is recommended for refusal for the details, re reason details in the report. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Um, on page 64, you, I mean, the, the reason that the uh, application is being called in is because uh, if uh, buildings occupying the same footprint and intended for the same non-residential purposes could have been erected under permitted development rights without any requirement for planning consent. On page 64, you state that the location of the proposed domestic garage in relation to the dwelling house means that this element of the proposed development will always require a formal grant of planning permission, even if its height were to be reduced. So even if the height of the development had been reduced, would it have required planning permission and therefore would SIPA have been consulted anyway? Jessica? The site is large, so there is scope to do the tractor shed and the garage within permitted development, but based on the location of the garage, uh, because of where it is, it would need uh, planning permission even if they reduce the height, but there is scope to move it to a different location and it would be PD. And, and, and would SIPA have been consulted? Uh, no, because it would be permitted development, so they wouldn't need... I mean, if, if the, the garage was on that site and required planning permission, would SIPA have been consulted in that case? I'll get David to answer that, Jessica. I think, basically, to make things clear, if something is permitted development, no planning application is required, SEPA don't require to be consulted. The, the difficulty is that whilst an element of this application could be amended to make it permitted development, namely the garage, the, sorry, the tractor shed, the garage is in a location where if it's in that location, it was always going to require permission. It doesn't matter whether you reduce the height of it. So it's the locational element, Indeed, which means um, it, it does require permission, which means CPR are consulted. Thanks, Elaine. Other questions, Archie? Can I just clarify? I could remember the embankment a planning application coming forward in 2014, and, and CPA, you know, consultation responses withdrew their objection to the application to remove the embankment and it would be, be beneficial in terms of reducing the level of risk to both Nursery Cottage and John Street. Now, it would be my understanding that, that SEPA should have looked at the whole of that particular area, not two particular streets, when that application came in. So it is in, in, in its um, history of the applications within that site, SEPA have been a little bit, um, i trying to think of the right word here, um, Naughty and yeah, exactly. Thanks, Andy. Naughty and in, in, in actually not thinking about other areas. So they, they've put the they, they've put the um, the objection in, but in actual fact, they should have thought about that back in the day in two thousand and fourteen when that embankment was removed. I can remember that, but I'm, I'm you know, would it be appropriate? I mean, I, I, and I understand where people are coming here because of the um, uh, the, the suggestion that had been made earlier on that if, if the guys had put the tractor shed up, they wouldn't have had to have a planning application, it's just the garage that's the problem here. Um, not, CEPA would not have commented on this, and, 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 and I just can't understand where they were coming from in 2014 looking after two streets rather than the whole area. I take it as just an observation because we're dealing with planning application here that doesn't include them two streets, and we're still only at questions for the case officer. Is that a question for the case officer, David McKee? Help yourself. Thank you very much. You're so kind. I notice there's a lot of steps on the outside of that building. Is there accommodation up the stairs or what's the intention for that, please? Right hand side joke of the picture halfway down. I thought there was another picture where they showed those to be outside, or are they outside or inside? They're inside. So there's accommodation upstairs? Yes, but they have applied for a domestic garage, so it will be for domestic use. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. David? I was going to say, if it helps, that on the right-hand side, that's a, you can see it's a cross-section, so it's not a, a gable elevation. That's showing you a section through the building, so it's an internal staircase. It still, in my view, raises an issue, Chair. Andy Ferguson. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm not sure if it's me just not being able to read the papers right, but 2.3, um, the, the flood risk management team were being asked uh, the comments 
in relation to this site, and as such, this response should be read in conjunction with the previous correspondence. Where's the previous correspondence? I don't think we always get the absolute information that's well, held. I, I, we got a condensed version, but... I, I think Jessica the point I'm making is it's, it's actually telling us to read it in conjunction with that. It's not there. Jessica will help you. Uh, the response is online and needs to be read in conjunction with that rather than... Because it was for a different application. So it's online, <laughs> online Andy. Yeah, we know reference how to get there. Search. <laughs> okay, we've got questions for the case officer. If there are no more, we have a, the, an objector, which is Ian Robertson or Erica Johnston on behalf of Dobita Community. Would you like to come forward, please? Are you Erica? Erica? <laughs> We've uh, we'll allocate you three minutes and I will remind you with 30 seconds to go ahead and draw, draw your presentation to a conclusion and just whenever you're ready, when you like to remain please so that members might ask you or have questions for you at the end of your presentation. Yes, um, I'm speaking on behalf of Dolbeta Community Council who have put in an objection. Um, what we would like to say uh, we think that the application should be refused. Our initial objection to the application was the size and design of the tractor shed. And it is still our view that, um, but our opinion of this building is that it's more like an industrial installation and is not suitable for a domestic situation, nor in the area that it is zoned, because the area is zoned in the LDP um for housing development and that the actual appearance of the shed seems quite industrial um, and we think that this will impact also on the visual amenity of the site uh, at the entrance to Dolbiti. Nowhere in the application is there any reference to the tractor shed being used only for domestic purposes, although it is in a domestic situation. Um, although it will be uh, cited within the garden of Nursery Cottage. And given the debate on the building size, we can see no reason why a smaller building will not suffice if this were the solution. And also that we are not expert enough to become involved in the technicalities of flood prevention and control, and we would leave this to those who are, SEPA and the flood risk management team, who have both objected to this application. However, contained within the application are suggestions that some future flooding, flooding would be acceptable to the applicant. Um, we believe that this is a risky way forward as future flooding severity cannot be predicted and this would not be acceptable in Scottish planning policy. It would also appear that the agent for the application is suggesting that a previous garage development in Dolbiti where SEPA were not consulted and the advice from the flood risk management team was ignored by planners to grant the application that it should be used um, as a precedent for the present application to inform decision making. And we feel that this advice should be ignored because by the planners due to the knock-on effect and each application should stand on its own merits. You have 30 seconds to go, Erica. Is that you concluded? That's me finished. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for that, Erica. Do any members of the committee have any questions for Erica? Andy? Um, it's, it's just a me crossing T's and dotting I's. Um, it's a kind of hobby horse of mine. We, we've got people coming from the uh, community councils, um, and I'm requesting, please don't take it personally, is, is this a mandated position after a court meeting? Yes, uh, so it is. So we're absolutely sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that, Andy. Any other questions for Eric? In that case, thank you very much for your presentation. If you'd like to resume thank your you. seat, that'd be fine. And we now have Charles Fulton, the applicant. Charles, is Charles here? Can you like just come forward, Charles? You will have the same uh, 
three minutes to make a presentation, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go to draw your presentation to a conclusion. Thank you, Chair. Um, I should firstly say that I'm disappointed that the slides that I uh, provided showing the pre-embankment removal and post-embankment removal uh, didn't feature in the slides, Your Honour. Uh, you have them. They're here for a year. Okay, I, I, you do it during your three minutes. So remember, you've only got three minutes. Well, I'd, I'd rather not. I, I, well, let's go through it. Please have a look. Looking down the stream uh, in 2012, before the embankment was removed. Next, this is it afterwards, um, and uh, you can see that. Uh, hopefully, you can see that the level of the ground uh, on the left, where I've created the yard, is lower than that on the right. <laughs> primary objective is to uh, uh, secure my property from flooding in, in future. The embankment, the, the culvert, the culvert, next slide please, the culvert has been removed. Um, it was a bottleneck for, for water. It was identified as an issue. It was identified as a source of uh, almost certainly flooding down John Street through my property and back through Queensgrove to the water course. Um, SEPA uh, were happy that that was removed. Um, next slide, please. That's the site, uh, the same view today. The culvert's gone. The, the, the 80 de 100 degree uh, angle into the culvert's gone. Um, uh, the bank on the right has been uh, uh, put to a higher level than that, that on the left. The yard on the left is a designed floodplain. It's there to assist in the case of a flood in future. I make no bones about it. If we are to have a flood, uh, then that will flood, okay? And my tractor shed, if it gets wet feet for a day or two, I can live with that. That's the point I was making. Um, next slide. That was the exit of the culvert. Next slide. That's it today. Um, the flow of water through that site will be so much easier uh, in future, and it will stay in the water course. Now, if I may go on to my, my notes here, I'd like to quote to you some correspondence. It's all to do with building on the floodplain. If it was out with the floodplain, there would be no issue. The fact that it is on the floodplain and the flood risk policy states that nothing can be built within specific flood risk zones means it must be objected to. The normal solution would be to move the proposal away from the flood risk area, but unfortunately the whole property is within the flood zone. I would still advise withdrawing the application and building under permitted development. Now that you have 30 was, seconds to go, sir. No. That was um, uh, advice from uh, a, a, a case officer to my agent who also designed my garage and shed here, um, another case in Dalbiti, where um, the, the, the ultimately the planners approved it, despite the fact it was on a floodplain, simply because the nonsense there is that it could have been built um, under permitted development but because, as my applications are just slightly higher, um, it was being refused. Can you and take the presentation to conclusion, please? We, we, we are essentially talking here about a contradiction between permitted development rights and Scottish planning policy. Thank you. Can you just remain in case members of the committee have questions for you? Dougie? Thank you, Chair. Um, Charles, uh, we heard earlier uh, a concern from the Community Council that the uh, the proposals, particularly around the, the tractor shed, uh, had the appearance of being industrial. Can you clarify, please, what, what is the purpose of having tractors on your property? Is, is it for mm -hmm. domestic activities, because it is a, a large a large area of land that you've got there, yeah. or is it for um, any sort of business purposes uh, in the site? No, not in the site. Um, I am a forester. Um, I have woodlands. My house is heated entirely by wood. Just so happens my girlfriend's house is heated entirely by wood. We go through a lot of firewood in a year. I have a tractor-powered um, wood processor, which I use to produce that wood. Um, and that's primarily why I have the tractor uh, and the wood processor. And I'm not happy about the fact that it's sitting out in the weather, deteriorating. Um, so that's primarily why I want the, the shed. Uh, but the shed itself will have other purpose, other uses for storage that allow me to work undercover as well. In terms of its appearance, uh, the report makes it quite clear that the case officer has no issues with the design and appearance and location of the shed or the garage. 
And for, for clarification, the reason I understand that um, the garage would need planning permission regardless uh, of, of its height uh, is simply because my agent made a mistake in its positioning insofar as permitted development rights require that you adhere frontage rules and he had taken the slightly uh, further forward elevation of my house towards the road as the permitted line of development. If it had been two metres back, then uh, we wouldn't have been having that uh, discussion. Do you? Um, the, the graphic that we saw earlier on uh, um, shows an image of a tractor inside the, the tractor shed. But it, the tractor looked quite small. Um, the tractor that you own, is it the sort of tractor you would see out in the, the rural roads from farms, or is it a, a, a smaller type tractor as appeared to be in, inferred by the, the graphic that we saw? It, it's, it's an older style tractor. It's not a huge modern style. It, it has a, a forestry background. Uh, in terms of usage. Um, but as I say, in terms of um, other things in the shed, I, I have, I have a, a, a wood processor I need to keep under cover. I've actually got a machine that makes kindling as well. But, you know, it, it, it's not difficult to... It's a big area, I hope you appreciate. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it doesn't, would not look out of scale uh, or, or out of character, indeed, with the, the backdrop it has there. And... and the case officer concluded that in a report to the committee. Thanks, Dougie. Elaine? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, the advice that we've had is that if the height of the tractor shed was reduced and the domestic garage really, uh, uh, located somewhere else within the, the site, it might have been allowed under permissive development. Would, would it be possible, in, in order for you to achieve what you want to achieve, would it be possible for you to to have a, a lower tractor shed, for example, or locate your garage elsewhere and well, therefore it, enabled it to be a sorry. permitted development? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, when my agent drew the, the, the garage, I didn't know he was going to put another storage area up, up top, but I thought, well, that's, that's fine. And he'd done it elsewhere, and in fact, he had got it approved elsewhere on a floodplain. Uh, in, in those circumstances, incidentally, it took a, a councillor's intervention with the planning department to make them see that it was a nonsense to reject it uh, as a planning application when it could be developed under permitted development. The same footprint on the same floodplain, just a bit extra height, and that's all I'm asking for. I could have, I could have avoided that situation um, by simply sticking to four metres. I wouldn't have the extra usable storage upstairs and with regards to the tractor shed, it could be built at four metres, but it would be a mono-pitch building, mono-pitch roof building, rather than a twin-pitch building, which I think aesthetically would not look anything like as, as good. But would you be able to locate both uh, your, um, all the equipment you want it to locate in? Would that, would that be possible in a smaller tra tractor shed? It would. The, the roof structure would be um, you know, less appealing. I would suggest. And, and as far as the extra height in the garage, well, yeah, a very useful storage space. Um, same footprint. Thanks, Elaine. Any other questions for the applicant? In that case, sir, if you'd like to resume your seat, thank you very much for your presentation. This item was called in by Councillor Davidson. Is Councillor Davidson here to speak to the address committee, or, or is he not? Anyone know? Presume he's not. In which case, we're in session, members. If there are no proposals, do we go with the officer's recommendation? Okay, unanimous decision of the committee in that to support the officer's recommendation. Can you just confirm what that decision is today, please? Uh, yes, Chair. The, the um, decision... The application is refused um, in line with the recommendations in the officer's report. Thank you, members. We come to agenda item number nine. Late listed building consent for installation of replacement UPVC windows and doors at Mikkel Dobite Dobite. This is a listed building consent application. The reference number is 18 stroke 1125 stroke LBC. The recommendation is to refuse 
and the case officer is Jessica again. <laughs> Jessica again, can you shut the curtains, Paul, please? And just whenever you're ready, Jessica, thank you. Okay, so um, this site is located on the edge of Dalbiti. Um, it is a Category C listed building. Um, the application is for late listed building consent. So the windows and doors have already been um, installed and it's for all the windows and doors in the property. Uh, the, the window is giving you uh, cross sections and details of the windows. So the windows are thick banded casement top opening windows, UPVC. The doors are the same, so they've got solid UPVC um, bottom and, and glazed top. So let's take you around. So this is the south elevation with the windows installed. In the south, so the east side elevation and part of the north elevation with the windows and the door. And this is the north elevation and the west. And it's just giving you a, a close up view of one of the windows and the styles. So, say the thick banding with the top opening casement in UBVC. <coughs> and this is another example of the smaller window that has been installed. The example, uh, this is the door and the second door. So these photographs in 2006, the council actually took a, undertook a survey of all listed buildings um, and a photographic record. And this is the photographs taken at that time, which show the original timber uh, sash and case windows um, installed. We also have evidence that from sales particulars in 2015, that the windows were still there in 2015. Essentially, there's um, two elements to this assessment. Firstly, is the design and mechanism and opening, and secondly, is the materials. So the windows that have been installed are modern casement design rather than the original sash and case. Uh, they have thick plastic frames rather than the original slim frames. <laughs> and so it's considered that the design, proportion, and the mechanism are not considered appropriate for listed building and do have a detrimental impact on the character. The use of UBVC in listed buildings is not uh, strictly prohibited in planning policies, but it's considered that the use of modern materials uh, doesn't really respect the character of historic buildings. There is evidence that, as I said, that the original timber windows were in the property until recently, and it's considered the use of standard casement UPVCs is detrimental to the character of the listed building, and the application is recommended for refusal details in number five. Thank you, Jessica. Can you open the curtain again, Paul, please? Members, we have questions for the case officer. Elaine. Um, I'm right in thinking from the map that this is a, <coughs> an individual building. It's not part of a conservation area or anything of that nature. It's an individual bu building on a farm. Yes. Thanks, Elaine. Ian. Could you confirm the, the distance of this house from the main road and how visible it is to the, to the area? Jessica. I actually can't because I haven't been on the site. <laughs> no, but I, um... Can you help, David? An indicative, an indicative distance would help. No, I could have only guessed, to be honest. Um, sorry. So we'll have to speculate what the distance is, Ian. Archie? Well, well, you can sort of work out here if you go to the top right-hand corner of page 65, there's a black line that says that length is 200 metres. It's about the same length as that, so it's between 150 metres and 200 metres. The face, Ian? I was just wanting to make sure the rest of the committee were aware of that. David Sutter will give us an exact figure. We'll continue with questions for the case officer whilst David's searching for an exact distance. Are there any other questions for the case officer? Okay, we're in session, Ian, we'll get that distance for you, Ivor. Chair, it's just, why was that building listed? You know, it's a typical farmhouse <coughs> on a typical farm anywhere. Maybe that's the very reason it was listed. Do you know why? Pardon? We're still on questions to the case officer. 
No, no, I said we would get an, uh, we would get an answer to Ian when we went into session. We're still in questions to the case officer. So the question is, why is it listed in the first place, Ivor? Do you know David or do you know Jessica? Yeah, why is it listed? Historic Scotland, Historic Environment Scotland now uh, do the listing, uh, not ourselves as the council, but they will have had a look at this and consider it to be a, a building of architectural or hysterical merit, which justifies it being listed. Okay, so Elaine? Do we know when it was listed? So it was listed by the council, was it? I yeah. guess it will all be listed at the same time, David. Um, no, well, the, the council doesn't do the listing. It would be listed by Historic Environment Scotland again. Uh, if if it really was listed in 1990. Uh, 1990, that's right, yeah. It, it would have been listed by the council in those days, not by Historic Environment Scotland, I think. No, we, we wouldn't list it. It would be the predecessor of Historic Environment Scotland, Historic Scotland. We, the council does not list buildings. But we just simply apply the legislation once that they're listed. Andy. Thanks, Chair. It's on the same uh, grounds and um, David's advice. The, the categories of listing um, is see the lowest category in terms of importance. Just David, for it's clarity. a common misconception that there's a, a pecking order. It's not the case. When a building is listed, it is listed, it's listed in its entirety. And the same policies apply nationwide for A, B, or C. The only recognition is that A is a building of national importance. So it's you know it's a um, you'd expect something um, perhaps on the Royal Mile or somewhere like that. Yeah, and that's a schedule mine. But yes, um, then B is regional and C is local. But exactly the the same principles apply. It's not like you can do one thing in a C that you couldn't do in a, an A. Okay, so we have uh, finished with questions for the case officer, and we'll come back to Ian's question when we go into session. We have Martin Robertson on behalf of Patricia Woodley. Martin, if you'd like to come forward, please. And you will have three minutes to do a presentation. I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go to draw a presentation to a conclusion. And if you remain in case members have questions for you, I'd be grateful. So whenever you're ready, Martin. Good morning. Uh, my name is Martin Robertson. I am chairman of the Architectural Hysteric Hist Heritage Society of Scotland, which seeks to represent the built heritage throughout, throughout the country. But today I am speaking on behalf of Dumfries and Galloway Cases Panel, of which I'm also a member. Our panel looks in detail at every application for alterations to listed buildings and also other buildings within conservation areas. We objected to this application and I am here now to support the recommendation of your planners that it be refused. We are in complete agreement with the detailed reasons for refusal which are given in your committee report. There are cases like this one where applications for retro retrospective consent are made and the matter can be rectified as there is ample evidence of the historic windows that have been illegally removed. It is sometimes the case that owners or their agents claim ignorance either of the listing or the need to get consent for the works undertaken. In the case of Michael Dalbiti, the application says, we did not realize that we required per permission to replace windows. Yet the house, which was listed in 1990, was specifically stated to be category C listed in the sales particulars in 2015. It's simply not good enough to claim ignorance of what listing entails. Dumfries and Galloway has excellent planning and conservation policy policies and guidance which have been democratically agreed and are enshrined in the <coughs> local, de local Development Plan 2014 and the Supplementary Guidance Historic Built Environment, Environment 2017. These closely mirror national policy and advice from Historic Environment Scotland, and both were contributed to by the AHSS during consultation. This advice gives carefully thought out support for the proper maintenance and upgrading of our, of our historic environment and the Council has professional staff capable of working with owners in interpreting and enacting the legislation. But even so, it is clear that problems remain. Many heritage buildings in Dumfries and Galloway rely mainly for character on simple, honest use of local materials and building skills. Their appearance and character can very easily be damaged by insensitive alteration, as has been the case with Michael Dalbiti. 
The AHSS has become increasingly concerned at the number of cases of unauthorized and, and inappropriate alterations to listed and other heritage buildings in Dumfries and Galloway, where the provisions of the planning legislation have been flouted. You have 30 seconds to go, sir. Granting retrospective consent in a case such as this will likely encourage others to carry out work without reference to the planning department and to the detriment of our, local, uh, of our regional heritage. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Robertson? Andy? Thanks very much. Um, I'm not sure if it's for Mr. Robertson or the Governance Officer because according to the papers, we've got one Timmy's representation was received, and that's the Architectural Heritage Society for Scotland. Yeah, I'm sure when he started his presentation, he actually said, I'm not representing him, I'm representing someone else. Is that competent? He's a registered speaker, speaking on behalf of Patricia Woodley, and that's a normal procedure in this committee. We don't ask questions, I would have to say, if it's a red statement, eh, but it's certainly acceptable that he can read a statement from a third party. But I'll ask Nick to help you with your question. Nick, as a governance officer. I think I think what you've said is is quite correct, Chair. I wouldn't I wouldn't um, have an issue with it. So it's been a prepared statement. So thank you very much for that presentation, sir. Uh, we now have Councillor David Stitt looking to address the committee. Councillor Stitt, you've got the same three minutes. I'll remind you of thirty seconds to go. And the normal procedure is when you've concluded your presentation, you leave the chamber and members go into session. And again, David, whenever you're ready. Right. Cheers, Chair. Thanks for letting me speak to this. As you see from one of the latter photos there at Meikle Debate Farmhouse for many years, to my eyes, has been neglected and badly needed a bit of repair. And I don't agree with what it's in the report saying it has damaged the special character of the building because I think what's been carried out enhances the look of the building. And also, it's hardly visible for the main road, which is a hawk road, which is about 200 yards off the main road, because it's always blocked out with trees. And also, the other way you can only see Muckle Debate Farmhouse is if it's Craig Near Road, looking across where the new campus at Debate School was built. And that was, uh, that was about 700, 800 yards away from the main road. I think it's only in a previous statement, it's enhanced the look of the building. And I uh, think it's only for the better of the building that the work has been carried out. Thanks for being so brief, David. Can you just remain in case members have questions for you? Any questions, David? Okay. Uh, uh, Elaine Murray, Elaine. I just wondered um, when this work was done. Is this, was it done because a new resident was in uh, in the property, or you know, did it coincide with maybe the the property coming into habitation? Or? The property was bought as part of by another by a farmer, and he bought the land just for mere or less the grazing land, and he carried out the work. This had been done about six months ago, I think, Lena. And are there people living in the property now? Or? No, I don't think so. Thanks, Lane Andy. Um, thanks very much, uh, um, Professor Stitt. I mean, you're obviously the lo local there. You know the area quite well. In your opinion, does, do these alterations that have been put in place actually safeguard the listed uh, building or, actual fact, uh, damage it? I would say it safeguards the listed building. As I said earlier, only enhances the look of the building at present. Any other? John Martin? Uh, John Campbell, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, li I like your uh, interpretation of the picture that you see there that says enhanced, but I'm sure we've seen in one of the reports there was a very tiny window, and when you see the thickness of UPVC, because of the nature of the type of windows, I wouldn't say that would actually enhance the building. Would you agree with that? I think it's up to the individual's opinion what you think of the building. You might have told Councillor Ferguson the same thing. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> In that case, Councillor Stitt, thank you very much for your presentation. Members, were in... Pardon? Oh, aye, please, aye. Before we have any speakers, Ian, the distance from the road to the farmhouse. Uh, Chair, yes, uh, the best I can get, sorry, I can't get into DGI with my new machine, but it appears to be around about 100 to 150 metres to the, the nearest houses. 
So, yes, well done. Uh, just as a quick point on that, the distance to other properties is entirely irrelevant because what you should be looking at is the character of the listed building. A listed building can be anywhere, and many of them are remote, so whether or not you can see it from public viewpoints is irrelevant. You're looking at the actual long-term character. And just a quick reminder that you can start a development uh, for planning permission, uh, jump the gun with it, and that's actually not an offence. If you carry out any unauthorised alterations to a listed building, that is a potentially criminally prosecutable offence. So it is a slightly different case to planning. Ian Blake, I've got David McKee and Elaine. Did you want to speak, Ian? No. Okay, David McKean and Elaine Murray. Hey, a month or two back, we had a look at a, a UPVC frame, which was much narrower. It was more in line with the, the wooden frame that had come out of a, a house. Would that have been acceptable in this case, if they could get, obviously, the, the small windows fitted into that? Well, we've already had this debate, and UPVC, as far as I understand, is not acceptable in listed buildings. It is in conservation areas sometimes, but David? The only one that the, um, the planning committee itself has looked at recently was the one at, I think it was Atkinson Place, is it, in uh, Kirkubri. Um, now, we'd recommended refusal for that one because of the fact it was really the inappropriate material, but the actual design of them is um, it's proper sash and case. They were slim line. They were well articulated. And whilst I, I still disagree with the use of the modern material, having seen them in situ, I think they actually do look acceptable and have retained the, the character of it. I think it's with our concern here, if you notice, it's two particular issues that we've raised. And the, the secondary one is the material. It's the, the fact that this is, to be blunt, it's fairly low and lowest common denominator style UPVC windows which have gone in here, which undoubtedly, in my mind, have affected the character of it. We've had a number of instances recently where we have carried out enforcement action. There was one at Kirkconnell, there was one at Kirtle Bridge. Uh, they were appealed and the appeal was thrown out and enforcement action was taken require, requiring them to be removed and appropriate windows reinstated. So there's a consistency issue here, and as I say, it, what's actually taking place here is actually an offence. Elaine? I just wondered, just for some clarification, if somebody wanted to delist a list C building, what, what procedure would they go through? David? There is a procedure where they would have to go to Historic Environment Scotland and provide a, a case, and they would then consider whether or not the character of the building had been so adversely altered that it would justify its, uh, its delisting. But that's not something we can control. The applicant has to apply to Historic Environment Scotland for that. Dougie. Thanks, Chair. David, um, I recall sometime last year um, we looked at a, a house in Loch Maben. We actually had a, a site visit because very similar circumstances. The, UP, the, the, the traditional windows um, had been replaced by UPVC um, and I think that in that particular case, uh, it had been recommended for refusal, but we uh, approved the application on the basis of the, the appearance. A, a lot of effort had been made into the appearance of the windows uh, to, to look very similar to the, the traditional wooden framed windows. I'm interested, you made a point that, that this case here is in effect an offence. Um, in the case in Loch Maben, if you, if you, if you recall it, um, was that the same case? Because, you know, this, this issue about, um, you can have UPVC windows as long as they are uh, sympathetic to the previous appearance of the house. Could you maybe clarify that if you've got a recollection of it? That was actually a very different case. That was if I, I'm not involved in it any longer directly, but I think that was a local review body case. And it'd be, it was not a listed building. It was in the conservation area. Therefore, it required planning permission, and it had been refused by officers, and therefore it came before the local review body who decided after a visit to, to grant permission, but it wasn't a listed building. A listed building could never come before the local review body because it's, by definition, not a local application. David. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, as to the use of the building at the moment, I, uh, I've 
I, I've seen for sale signs down there, and I think there's a similar building listed on the internet for sale, so I think it's for sale. Um, I think it's pretty clear to anyone who has a listed building that, that um, they should be talking to planning about windows other than, uh, you know, a total restoration. So, um, and since they may well have found out that, that there were acceptable UPVC windows that may have resulted to, to an, in a, um, an opinion that we should um, approve this and, and that possibly isn't the case today. I don't, I don't really feel as um, sympathy for the application and um, you know it's, it seems to be out with what's acceptable so I personally wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't want to approve it. So can you just repeat that? Are you proposing we approve it or are you proposing we refuse it? I uh, refuse. Yeah. We refuse it. Um, so you go with the officer recommendation? Yeah, I mean, we're not allowed to probably take into account other applications, but I think we're in, in danger as a committee of approving too many <laughs> um, uh, retrospective applications. And, and this one is pretty clearly done in the full knowledge that it wasn't um, conforming. Um, and uh, doesn't look to conform to me, so um, I'd like to refuse. I don't think we'll record the fact that in the full knowledge they were not conforming as part of the thing. I just will go with it. Yeah, you right, yeah. you proposed yeah. that they would go yeah. off to recommendation. I've got Katie yeah. and then Archie. Thank you, Chair. I'm just really looking for clarification, really. In, on page 74.5, there's a statement from Historic Environment Scotland regarding managing changes in historic environment, and it refers to windows and in the last sentence it says new double glazed windows may be acceptable if they can closely match the original window design detail and materials. Now can I ask is that in relation to listed buildings or conservation areas because you know obviously a, a listed building is different than being in a conservation area and I think that's where clarity would be quite useful here. David? Well again just to be clear double glazing doesn't mean UPVC, you can have timber double glazed windows. And again, we've been supportive wherever possible um, for listed buildings to have traditionally designed but double glazed windows, because we do want to make sure that buildings are properly, um, in terms of carbon reduction, they're properly insulated. But it is unfortunately a little bit of a myth that the only way to get a sustainable development is actually to use um, UPVC, you can do just as well with timber. In fact, it's a far more sustainable material. So double glazing doesn't mean what you see here. Archie. <coughs> Thanks very much. I'm just, I'm just clarifying. We are in session. Run this past me again. We are in session. We are in session. We already have a motion okay. from okay, David thanks. that we refuse I, 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 as per the officer's thanks, recommendation. Th thanks, here. And, and, and to be honest with you, I do have some sympathy for the application uh, on getting the house warm, but that's about where my sympathy ends with this. You may remember a couple of years in Sankar, there were several windows that were UPVC, and we said no to that one as well. I think the issue here is the standards and expectations of all areas in Dumfries and Galloway with regard listed buildings of what we would see as a difference of, of opinion in, in these areas. To that end, Chair, I think we need to go with the recommendations on this particular uh, application because, as has been seen in the photographs, there is some several windows here which, which is not not good standard for that particular building. And are you seconding David's proposal? Okay, that's good. Uh, David McKee, where is it? You like to see the gentleman that's sitting in the corner there, Chair. No disrespect, no. Oh, David, I sorry. I did say to you at the outset, as soon as you finish, you're obliged to leave the chamber. My apologies, <laughs> David. Accept to the belt and don't do it again. <laughs> uh, so we have a motion and a second to refuse the application. Andy Ferguson. Thanks. Just um, if the officers know um, or can confirm to us that the the changes, i.e. the UPVC, have actually been put in by the current owner, or were they put in before? David? As far as I'm aware, the applicant put them in because they're applying retrospectively for them. Yeah. Um, I, no, the reason I, I asked the question is because I had to retrospectively apply because <laughs> someone else put them in and they were someone else had put them in in my house 
they had to, and uh, I had to apply for retrospective plan permission, as you know. I, and um, but the culpability lay with the previous owner because it was a listed building. That, uh, as far as I know, the house changed hand, but it was certainly on the market in 2015, and uh, we'd had it confirmed earlier that the works were carried out in the last six months. So I'm, I'm fairly certain the applicant is the current owner. Okay, so we have a, a motion and a, a second to refuse. Are there any alternative proposals? In that case, it's an unanimous decision of the committee. Hey, can you confirm the decision of the committee, please? Uh, yes, the um, the decision is to refuse the application at, as set out in the recommendations in the report. The next two applications might be of some length. Should we have a recess, have a lunch? And yeah, okay. We'll break now and we'll come back in 30 minutes. Good afternoon, members. Welcome back to the Planning Applications Committee meeting. We move on to agenda item number 10. Consultation regarding an application made under section 36 of the Electricity Act 1989 for the proposed North Lowther Energy Initiative wind farm, comprising an erection of 30 wind turbines, maximum tip height 149 metres, and associated infrastructure at proposed North Lowther Initiative Wind Farm near One Lock Head. The application type is a section 36 consultation. The recommendation, or oh, the reference number 17 stroke 1377 stroke S36. The recommendations to raise objections and the case officer is Andrew Robinson. Hey, Paul, can you shut the curtain again, please? And Andrew, can you take us through your presentation whenever you're ready? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, as the application has been submitted under Section 36 of the Electricity Act, uh, the Council is not the final decision maker in this application. However, it is a statutory consultee. Um, the application site um, is situated in the Lowther Hills between One Lockhead and Sanker, and it lies entirely within the Dumfries and Galloway um, border area. Um, we've got One Lockhead here, uh, Sanker. And the border with South Lanarkshire is just is just there. Uh, the full details of the scheme is described in paragraph 1.5 of the report. Um, but in essence, it proposes 30 149 metre wind turbines, uh, the formation of two site access points from the B740, which is the road leading up from Croik, uh, which would then have a total of 29 kilometres of access tracks. Uh, five borough pit locations and four temporary construction compounds. Um, the scheme um, was amended throughout. Um, it originally proposed 35 wind turbines, so just to give a bit of context to that, um, the applicant removed five turbines in the southern part of the site and an associated access track to that. Um, the scheme proposes forest re removal, uh, and this shows the areas that would be removed and not replanted, which are highlighted in dark grey. And there's also areas uh, of forestry that are proposed to be felled and replanted, which are highlighted in green. Um, the proposed turbine um, elevations, um, they're a typical three blade uh, turbine up to 149 metres. Uh, the hub height is proposed to be around 89 metres. And the two access points, um, this one is proposed near Spango Farm, um, where there's actually an existing access to a forestry um, route into the Lowell Hills. Uh, the dark grey area is, um, is effectively a runoff area that would be proposed and the second access point is further down the, the B740 at, uh, beside Nethercog. So here's the carriageway construction, and this is the runoff area, which will be um, temporary for, to allow access for the turbines. Um, in terms of ZTV, this is the blade tip. So just to quickly run through what these are. The blue areas I highlight areas where you'd see one to seven turbines. The green areas are where you would potentially see eight to 14 turbines at blade tip. Yellow is 15 to 22, and the pink represents areas where it'd be theoretically possible to see 23 to 30 turbines. And just to zoom in into the, the area, the black line is to indicate an, an area of up to 15 kilometers. 
and in terms of hub height, it's the same, um, same key. And again, zooming into the area within 15 kilometers. Um, paragraphs 1.19 to 121 of the report um, lists all the commutative uh, wind energy developments. I'll run through these just to give you an idea. Here's the application site um, highlighted here. This is proposed Harryburn Wind Farm, which um, went to this committee as, a, as we were a consultee back in March um, this year, where this council raised an objection to that. That is currently progressing to a public local inquiry as we speak. Uh, the green um, triangles represent wind energy developments that have been consented or are operational. So to the south, you've got consented 20 shilling. Um, Whiteside Hill has recently just finished construction, as has Sanka. Uh, Sandy Now is a consented scheme, as is Glen Muckluck and Lethens. And further afield, you've got um, operational Hare Hill and Hare Hill Extension. Uh, to the east from Harryburn, you've got the Clyde and Clyde Extension cluster. Further afield is, is the Mini Gap cluster. So in terms of the landscape character area, the application site lies entirely within the Southern Upland Lowther uh, range. Um, to the northwest is the Northwest Lowthers, and the valley is um, the Upper Dale, Nithdale landscape character. And further afield, you've got other character types within the Southern Uplands, and some of the valleys have their own landscape character types, um, as identified on the plan. Uh, in terms of designations in the site, um, part of the site lies within the Thornhill Uplands Regional Scenic Area. So here's the site and here's the boundary, or, and this is the Regional Scenic Area. And um, in close proximity to the northwest of the site, the boundary effectively of the site follows the road. You've got the Muirkirk and North Lowther um, Uplands Triple S I and SPA, which has been designated for breeding birds. And the designated landscapes further afield, um, so you've got uh, Lead Hills and Lalda Hills area within um, South Lanarkshire. Uh, the green areas on there highlight uh, areas of visibility to blade tip. Um, this is visibility within the landscape character areas. It's, it's, it's just a simple visibility showing where within the landscape character areas um, you would see visibility and the different character areas are, are in different colours. And in terms of visual receptors, um, the lines represent um, walk footpaths, really. So you've got the Southern Upland Way in purple, which then runs through the site to Lowther Hill and then continues um, further to the northeast out of the area. Uh, the green is Old Drove Road, which um, runs southeast towards the site. Uh, blue is Enterkin Pass, and orange is Coffin Road, which sort of deviates away from the Southern Upland Way before rejoining it. So in terms of commutative impacts of this scheme, um, the light blue areas um, illustrate construction only, so that will be Whiteside Hill, Wind Farms, and Middlemere, which is, um, which is in East Ayrshire. Uh, the dark blue areas will show where you would see the proposed wind farm and construction, really down here. Uh, the, ex the yellow represents existing wind farms. So that's Hare Hills, Sanka, Sunnyside, and Clyde wind farms. That's visibility of existing wind farms. Um, the areas of orange, some here, some here, uh, that shows the proposed scheme and existing. Uh, the green areas uh, highlight where you see existing wind farms and those that are consented. And the red areas illustrates where you would see all three of these. This shows the proposed scheme and those schemes that have been consented. So the purple represents just the consented scheme. Um, the dark blue illustrates areas where you would see both the proposed and consented. And in terms of the high burn scheme, um, the purple illustrates areas of the, the proposed wind farm um, and the dark blue illustrates where you would see both the proposed and consented. Moving on to the uh, viewpoints, this is the first viewpoint, which is actually taken within the site, but it's on the Southern Upland Way. Now, in all of these, um, the Y lines, I'll just go through what they represent. So the, 
The blue illustrates the proposed scheme. Uh, green turbines represent those that are consented. Um, any purple turbines represent uh, application at the time that the um, information was submitted with the application. Black identifies existing wind farms and light blue illustrates construction. So running through this, you are looking west. So you can see um, in the foreground is the proposed scheme. Uh, looking north, proposed scheme and uh, other clusters of, of wind farms. <laughs> Uh, looking to the east, that's where proposed Harry Burn is, and looking south from this viewpoint is the uh, proposed wind farm. And in terms of the photomontage, this is actually looking west. Um, this viewpoint is taken from the Southern Upland Way, uh, just above One Lock Head. So as you're approaching One Lock Head, so this is the photomontage, the Y line on the bottom, and representative photomontage above. And along the hill, which is quite a key viewpoint, um, which is the highest point of the Southern Upland Way. Um, so the top um, shows looking west. So you've got the application site in the foreground. We've got a bigger photo montage of that one. I'll come on to that in a sec. Uh, looking north is towards South Lanarkshire, so proposed Harry Byrne and the Clyde clusters. Uh, looking east is um, landfall. And then looking south, you've got Ulsey Side, and which is a proposed scheme, and Whiteside Hill. And this is the viewpoint. This is the proposed wind farm from this viewpoint, and it's showing from the east um, to, towards the west. Um, this is from uh, a viewpoint just above the A76. So the top slide is looking towards the site, looking north, uh, looking east on the bottom looking south and looking west and then it's just the y line and photo montage from what you would see within the the nith valley and this is taken from the back road um, around sanka which goes near the golf course so again that's a y line and a photo montage <coughs> to the north of sanka this is from koik multiverse park um, so that's Y line and the actual photograph on site. We've got a photo montage coming up of that. Um, this is looking south. And then you're looking west and you can see the, the proposed wind turbine. And here is the uh, Glen Mucklick and proposed Lettons clusters. And then this is from that viewpoint, um, photo montage and Y line. Um, this viewpoint shows really where the second proposed access is. So you can see <coughs> three turbines visible, but this is where the proposed access road is, you can, which has been included on the photo montage that would lead up to the site. This is taken further afield from the Southern Upland Way so as, you, as you're approaching the site. So this is a, a, a little bit more of a longer range. So this is looking northeast towards the site, looking southeast. And then looking in the other directions, so southwest, and then the bottom one would be looking northwest with the upper Nithdale cluster of wind farms shown there. And then that's the uh, photo montage from the Southern Upland Way as you would approach the site. And you can see Sanka just at the within the bottom of the valley. Um, from within Kellerholm, um, this is an on-site <laughs> photograph. Um, and from this viewpoint, there would be um, community um, views. This is on the same street um, which you can see Sanka Wind Farm. Yes, here. And this is the photo montage and Y line from this viewpoint looking towards the site. And this is effectively looking in a similar direction to the, to the on site photograph. Um, and from further afield, this is the final photo montage. This is just looking um, from further afield, just to the northwest of Thornhill and close to Drumlanry Castle. So it's really just to illustrate the scheme as it would be uh, seen from long distance views in the Lowther Hills. So you can see the Lowther Hill range here and the proposed scheme is just here. Uh, there's, a, there's a few residential properties within three kilometers of the site. A couple within the application sites are actually within the applicant's financial interest. Um, 
We've included the wire lines um, from those properties which have been considered in the ES to have significant effects. So this is from a property, Brandley's Farm, to the south of the site. And again, from um, the, just Y lines on these ones. Um, again, this is from close proximity to that previous property. This is from Spango Farm Group from to the north of the site. And then a property called Muirhead, which is to the south of the site. So um, having assessed the consultation responses received internally from the council, um, it's considered that the proposed development, by virtue of its location, siting, and scale of turbines and general design, would give rise to an unacceptable strategic community landscape effect, as it would extend development into an undeveloped area of the Lowther Hills between the Clyde clusters and those developments in Up and Thisdale. It would have an unacceptable direct impact on the Lowther's unit of the Southern Uplands landscape character type and an unacceptable indirect impact on the Upper Nisdale unit of the Upper Dale. Uh, it's also considered that the proposed wind farm, gained by virtue of its location, siting, scale of turbines and general design would appear as a visually dominant and incongruous development which would result in significant adverse visual and cumulative visual effects in itself and in combination with other approved or built wind farms from a number of sensitive receptors. And Pro's wind farm, again, by virtue of its location, siting, and scale of turbines and general design would adversely influence the northern section of the Thornhill Uplands Regional Scenic Area, sufficient to compromise the special qualities of the designated area. As such, this proposal is considered contrary to the Council's development plan policies, as well as Scottish planning policy, which states that planning permission should be refused where the nature or scale of a proposed development would have an unacceptable impact on the natural environment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andrew. Can you open the curtain again, please, Amy? Amy, can you open the curtain, please. Thank you. Hey, members, questions for the case officer at this time, Archie and then Ian. Yeah, Chair, thanks very much. <clears throat> I think there's, there's sort of perhaps two or three questions I have on, on this particular report. In, in, in page 95 on representations at 3.1, it says, obviously, we are... Um, we're not the, 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 the planning authority, it's the Scottish Government as the planning authority, but it says there's no not applicable for representations. I, I, I maybe I've picked this up wrong, or maybe my, my mind's playing games with me, but in previous applications, even when we were just the, um, you know, one, one of the, the consultees, we did have third party representation. Now, I'm not, I, I can't remember if that is, I've just, I'm just, Raising that as a point, why why is there no representations applicable? Because I think we have had in the past. Secondly, um, I'm sure some members may have had phone calls from from people with regards to this, and they talk about the local public inquiry. If we go with the recommendations, now I don't like any verbal bullying or in that of, of of members, and I did say to them, I will not make any recommendations. That, you know, when speaking to them, I will not say whether I'm going to support or object to any proposals. But they talk about the cost of a, a local public inquiry in, um, <laughs> if, if we go with the recommendations. And they, they keep on mentioning this £100,000 that will cost the council in a time when councils are getting you know, less and less budgets from uh, governments. So I, I, I'd like to understand, first of all, um, why there's no representation. And secondly, what, how, how can you tell how much a cost would be for local representation if there might not be a local public inquiry. Um, so perhaps we can get some clarity on that. David? As far as the representations is concerned, as far as I can recall, for many years, we've had nothing quoted in terms of representations for a Section 36 application because they don't, the representations actually don't come to us. They, they go straight to the energy consent unit to the Scottish Government. So it would be wrong of us to actually put any representations in there. Any third parties, any community council, for example, for a Section 36 consultation have to go to them. So I don't recall in many recent years quoting it. Uh, yeah, well, indeed. Um, in respect to the other one, I, I'm unaware of the fact that you'd had all the phone calls. And I suppose members are there to be lobbied, but at the same time, uh, it's for you as a committee to take on board all the material planning considerations. It shouldn't be 
uh, regarded as a threat, that it's going to be a cost for a PLI. Um, it's inherent that there will be a cost with it. We know that. But the, the correct decision has to be made on planning grounds. And uh, if uh, there's a cost involved, so be it. Okay. I mean, obviously there are, there are uh, knock-on effects to, to this as well. And if, and it's only an if, we raise no objections to this, uh, we would have to give reasons to raise no objections. Yeah. David? Yes, I mean, you, you would have to clearly state the reasons why, um, because given that the officers have given a clear assessment of it and the effect how it's considered to be contrary to the LDP, and the related supplementary guidance, uh, you would have to give justifications for overriding that. But more than that, you would probably have to give us some steer as officers as to what legal agreements and or conditions you'd want to attack. We, we obviously have a fairly standard list on the NG Consent Unit. Indeed, has a, a list of standard conditions they apply, but we would still need to give advice to them as to what the local authority would be looking for. I've got Ian Blake. I think Elaine indicated to speak, and I've got Andy Ferguson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my point's uh, about Andrew's presentation, and it by no means is a criticism about the presentation, but the reference in the Y diagrams, particularly to the accumulative effect, and then relating the colours. Uh, Andrew's obviously working with the current technology, but to me, every single part of that diagram was in black and white, uh, and I think I've got fairly good eyesight, although I'm wearing glasses for, for reading. It just, uh, you know, in, a ge in general terms, is there some way that this could be enhanced? David? We, we've had this discussion quite regularly, but really, when we are giving you these visualizations, it is to give some assistance and maybe members who haven't had the time or opportunity to look at the actual documents or see them online. It's just to put it up on the screen so you have something to go on. But Again, I would reiterate the key document and the way it should be actually viewed is in the paper format at a certain viewing distance, which is all quite prescribed. So we're actually, by putting it on the screen, to a degree we're almost misleading you because it's not the way it was produced, it's not the way it intended to be viewed. So we have in the past, I know um, with some of the wind farms, put copies of the visualizations in the members' lounge beforehand. I don't know if we've been maybe forgotten to do that recently, but we could start doing that again if that would assist because that is how you're meant to actually view them in the paper copy right in front of you yeah certainly i think i think that would certainly help me i think a bit of other members so in the future we'll have visualizations of members lounge thank you helene did you indicate you wanted to speak yes thanks um really it's uh, i suppose it follows on from what archie has said that we don't get a copy of any of the representations and yet Forster have written to us saying the host community council of Sankar and the Upper Nithsdale Community Trust have both written in support of the application as have over 100 residents living locally, many welcoming the economic benefits of the scheme. Now I know that goes up to the Scottish Government because it's the Scottish Government that has to, to make the decision in regard of that. But in terms of our submission, are we only permitted to say what our objections are? Are we permitted to make any comment on any aspect of it which we might think were beneficial? David? Well, obviously, the, the socioeconomic benefits are a material consideration, and Andrew's report has covered that um, in four point, well, page 116 and 117. So it is something that we, we have to bear in mind as a material consideration. But obviously, at risk of uh, sounding like a stuck record, if the, the community benefit to a community council is being put forward as a socio-economic benefit, then that can't be taken into consideration for a planning yeah, But we, we can't see that because we don't see any of the representation, so we have no idea what actually they're saying, whether they're saying it benefits them or whether they say it benefits the rest of the community. And it was more that in terms of the recommended decision, our decision has to be only about what we don't like about the application, but we don't say anything about anything that we might think was beneficial. Well, the, the, really, the council is being asked by the Scottish Government to say whether or not they object to it, and that's all they're, they're really asking from us. If the council isn't minded to object to it, then the standard practice is to give a list of conditions and or legal agreements that we would request that the Scottish Government consider for putting in place. But it's a fairly limited thing. We are being consulted by the Scottish Government 
for our internal consultation comments. So that's why if you actually look at the comments that you've got, they're, they're all council internal officers. So you've got landscape architect, the archeologist, roads, it's people like that. It doesn't go, we don't consult any further than internally. Thanks, Lane. Andy Ferguson. It's actually kind of on the same grounds, and I, I think I'm looking for a bit of guidance here. Uh, it, my understanding is this is the council's response <coughs> to the process, whether we agree, you know, whether we object or not. I'm not That's right. right. Yeah. And what I don't find very helpful, I have to say, are huge tracts of this report, which are actually other statutory consultees' responses. Because we shouldn't be even considering them, because that's no, that's not that's not our role here. Um, so, um, why? It's, I think I'm, I'm I'm really struggling here to find out why there's so much here from statutory consultees outside us. Because we I, 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 well, the, the, the thing is, no, the, the, we we're being asked to put our our views in, right? not reflect the views of other statutory consultees. And that seems to be a lot if of the what's If the recommendation appeared without that information, the first thing you'd ask is how you got to that conclusion. David? Well, well sorry, can I, can I just ask for clarification as to well, what it's, external it's, it's, consultees... It's like the SNH, David, for example, and uh, um, some of the uh, historic stuff. Um, and it, it, it's all covered there. There's, there's massive tracks here in, in this that I'm reading that are talking about the different parts of the Lowther Hills and, uh, uh, well, where do you want to start? Um, there's pages and pages and pages of it. I had one there, the now, um, uh, it's, um, give me a second, I'll come back to it and I'll, I'll find find exactly the ones. I'm, I'm jumping about here looking at the archaeological sites and surrounding areas, for example, um, uh, National uh, Historic Scotland commenting on that. Yeah, I'm just finding it uh, by the biodiversity about South Lanarkshire biodiversity strategy and everything else. That's not what we should be concerned here. It's what our uh, what our strategy is. So, Andrew's yeah. suggesting that it doesn't affect our council policy. David, can you maybe assess? Well, again, I can only reiterate. If you look at page 82 through to page 95, there's eight consultation responses, every single one of them is an internal council consultee. There's nothing from SEPA, there's nothing from SNH, MOD, NATS, all the other parties that you would normally expect to see if you're dealing with a planning application. So we've restricted it only to internal consultees. Okay, if that's all the questions, John, for a case officer. These turbines are 149 metres high. Have we given consent to any turbines of such a height previously? Andrew? Um, I'm, my mind's working. Yes, we have. Um, there was a recent... Um, in July, we brought Log Wind Farm, um, which is at the top of the Log Valley. So you've got the water of Ken. So west of Moni Ive, go up the Log Road. That was a nine turbine scheme, and there were some 149 meter uh, turbines proposed, and that has been, was approved. Uh, that's the one I could think of. I think Windy Rig, which is near there, was 140 meter high turbines. The, the only other one I can remember was Windy Standard 3, where as officers we'd recommended approval for that, <coughs> the committee um, refused that one. Um, there, there is a critical threshold, more than 150 metres uh, in height, then the CAA wants to see a permanent um, red light on it for aviation traffic. Mm -hmm. it's so just a, that's we'll, why you we'll, see a lot come in at 149.9. I, I, I can't remember seeing so many of such a height before, 30 at 149 metres. It's usually visually... Thanks for that, John. If there are no other questions for the case officers, uh, this is a non-speaking item, so members are on session. Archie? 
Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking right through this um, and, and, and see that the internal um, council officers are, are, are raising, you know, the biggest majority raising no objections at all. We do have the energy policy that we're, we're driving forward with um, things like borderlands and things like that. Um, it, it's my opinion in, in this case that the socio-economic benefits actually outweigh the issues rega uh, regarded in the, um, the report. So I would like to suggest that we raise no objections uh, on the condition that we have the necessary legal agreements and um, work on Southern Upland Way management plans, transport plans and conditions that are already in through our uh, council officers in the report are placed in, in that particular order. So um, that's what I would suggest, Chair. Andrew? I'm happy to second that, Chair. Any alternative views? David McKee and Jen Maitland. Sorry, sorry about that. I'll catch up with you. Um, I'd prefer to go with the officer's recommendations, Chair. I think that, as we've seen on the, the maps that were up on the wall there, the amount of turbines in this area are horrendous, to put it mildly. And I think we, we've got to, got to come to this, the stage when we say enough's enough and I think uh, enough's more than enough in this area and all, just to, as an aside David mentioned about uh, under 150 metres he did need permanent lights but what we're no considering is the height they are above sea level should that, should that <coughs> not be considered when uh, aviation lights are required on these things but I'd, I'd certainly move that we go with officer's recommendations Okay, Jen Maitland. Yes, I'm inclined to follow our own policies, um, and I agree with Councillor McKee. I'm quite happy to second um, his uh, proposal to go with a recommendation. Um, I am not persuaded that seven jobs in the local area should um, um, overcome the, uh, the objections in terms of the effect on the natural environment um, and it is perfectly clear from the recommendations that uh, we are not necessarily also complying with Scottish planning policy um, where um, these sort of things should be refused when the nature and scale of the proposed development would have an unacceptable impact on the natural environment. And for that reason, I'm very happy to second Councillor McKee. Okay, do we need some language from the proposer and seconder of the motion to raise no objection you have to give a reason for it that that fits governance it was my understanding that i said that the, the socio-economic um benefits outweigh the objections provided by the officers there but we do need legal agreements in place to ensure things like the the southern Upland management plans are in place for our um, access officers the transport plans are in place for the movement of, of things and, con and the conditions that are in the, um, the responses from internal officers' uh, responses to the, to the application. I don't think we can take socioeconomic as, as a consideration if it's community benefit that we're talking about, but I'll ask Nick and then David if that's an acceptable proposal. Nick? I think I'd have to defer to David's advice on this one, Chair. David? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think there have been maybe one or two instances in the past where just a very blanket socioeconomic benefit has overridden clear planning policy. And I, I'm not comfortable, really, that without it being fleshed out, as Councillor Maitland said, we've got seven jobs being talked about here. Is, is that really sufficient to override it? And another thing to point out, as Andrew mentioned earlier, immediately adjacent to this site, you have Harryburn, which is in South Lanarkshire, and as a committee, you resolve to object to that one. So it's now proceeding to a public inquiry. So that, there were very similar grounds why you objected to that one, but you're not objecting to this one. Um, Ivor? Can I ask, what are the seven jobs? Do they actually exist? Will there be additional seven jobs? Or is it like a wind developer once told me, well, we employ a company and they actually just 
bring somebody in now and again. It might be two days a year that they're on site. What are those seven jobs? It also states 256 jobs will be supported. I would suppose if you took my councillor's allowance, I could justify 256 jobs because if I go into the supermarket at Morrison's <laughs> and I buy my, my, uh, my groceries there, I'm responsible for all the people in Morrison's. No, I'm not responsible for so much of it. But these figures are just figures in a report. We don't know what these jobs are. Is that a rhetorical question? How can we agree to an e economic impact when we don't know what the facts are because we don't have somebody here to ask what these jobs are? Okay. Same question, how can we agree on ecological grounds when we don't know how many birds are going to be there? It's exactly the same question. Well, I've certainly not going into that exchange today. It, it's, it's a question that if David can answer, we'll have to leave it hanging because clearly it's, 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 a, it's an application of the Scottish Government and we are asked to apply council policy to this and see whether or not it fits council policy. I've been told by council officers at Disney and if you are of the opinion at Disney, you need to say why at Disney. So yeah, I'll come back to what I said before, and it has been said, I believe that the socio-economic benefits are far outweigh what's been put in this report. And that has been said before in other uh, wind farm applications. Um, the situation of legal, uh, legal agreements is, 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 you know, we've, we've written legal agreements prior to this with other wind farms, and, and therefore I propose that's, that's the way we go forward. I would like to, however, see some uh, management plans of Southern Upland Way as part of those conditions and the transport plans and also the conditions that have been said within the report that the, uh, there is no objection from council officers on roads and other places um, that, that those, those considerations are taken in place. It's a very difficult one because David's clearly saying that's not adequate. Elaine and then David McKee. I think, again, it's, it, it, the problem is the sort of information that we have in front of us, really, in, in determining this, because we've also had something sent out to us by uh, the applicant, which refers to three projects, this project, the Energy Park, which I don't think is consented, but the Glen Mucklock, which is consented. And that's claiming that, it, that they, together they provide up to 33 full-time equivalent jobs during operation, and a community benefit of up to £735,000 annually. So that's some other information, I think, to a certain extent. That, you know, that indicates that there would be a very significant socio-economic benefit, and which is, you know, part of my frustration that we have to, we have to either say we object or we don't object, but we can't actually highlight what might be, good and what, what might be uh, more objectionable about the, the, the proposals. I think that it's already been said we cannot take community benefit into account. David? Well, I do find it rather, yeah, members are obviously party to information that the applicant has seen fit to send to yourselves only and not copy to officers. So I'm finding it difficult to actually advise you on this because you're party to information that's not been shared. So you're making a decision on basis of information that is not in the public domain that we don't have. So if you're of the opinion of what you've received is sufficient to give you that comfort, then so be it. I can't overrule it. Joe McKee. I think I think I got a letter to that guy today and I've got a shredder in my room. And when I open that letter, that's the first place it goes into the shredder. I never read them. Uh, what, what we've oh, got to uh, I'm, I'm here to to be told what people want and the applicant should be here explaining what he wants. Know what no, other people's no, ideas no. are. Applicants and with all due respect, it. Chair, I'm sure you'll recall as well. When community benefit first came in, we as a council suggested that half comes to us and the other half goes to the community involved. And that was refused. The community wanted the lot. So what you're saying about community benefit and where it can be used is totally irrelevant because we have no input whatsoever into that. <coughs> and I, I go with the, ra the raising objections, Chair. I didn't say anything about community benefit where it could be used. What do you respect, Chair? I wasn't referring to you. I'm talking to the committee as well. What I was saying was we're not allowed to take 
the, the community benefit into account when determining an application. It's an arrangement, it's a voluntary arrangement between wind farm developers and local communities. That's what it is. It's not part of the planning process. I'm really unhappy that we're getting into this situation, and David Sutty is quite right. We object socioeconomic benefit would come to Lead Hills, maybe, if that Harry Byrne had been approved, and we object to it, and now we find ourselves supporting this because we think there's some money coming to the area. But anyway, I will accept the proposal, and I'll accept the amendment. I'm going to vote. Can you remind members what the vote is, David? Uh, Nick, please. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, proposed by Councillor Driver and seconded by Councillor Juicy, Juicy is to raise no objections on the grounds that the socio-economic benefits outweigh um, the issues raised in the officer's report, but this is, this is to be subject to appropriate um, management plans, legal agreements, and transport plans, etc., being put in place. The amendment proposed by Councillor McKee and seconded by Councillor Maitland is to um, raise objections as set out in the officer's report. Go at the vote next, please. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor John Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Doogie Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Dryborough. Councillor Fairburn. He's not here. Councillor Ferguson. <laughs> Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, motion. Councillor Juicy. Motion. Councillor Hagman is not here. Councillor Hislop. Councillor James is not here. Councillor Lever. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Martin. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Murray. Councillor Tate. Councillor Young. Amendment. We have five members voting in favour of the motion and ten in favour of the amendment. The amendment is therefore carried and objections are raised as set out in the report. Are you, are you sure it's five? I make it six. I make it five. Do you... Yeah. That is right. Okay. Go to agenda item number 11, erection of eight wind turbines and ancillary infrastructure including transformer kiosks, eight crane pads, control building and substation compound, temporary construction compound, one permanent anemometer mast, maximum height 60 metres, two temporary anemometer, anemometer masts, maximum height 60 metres, underground cabling, two borrow pits, Formation of new vehicular access and construction of site access tracks at variance with conditions 1, 10, 26, 27, 28, 29 and 30 of planning permission granted under the terms of DPEA appeal reference PPA-170-2105. These conditions relating to the date of commencement of the development, turbine type and dimensions and noise emissions at Labrax. Les Walt Stranra. This is a full application, premise number 18 stroke 0539 stroke full, recommendation to refuse, and the case officer Chris McTeer. Chris, just, well, may Amy, can you shut the curtain again, please? And uh, Chris, just take through your presentation, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you for reading through the rather wordy description of uh, the application in front of us this afternoon. Um, it's here. Uh, in front of members uh, as it's an application for major development uh, as set out in the hierarchy of development regulations. Uh, the application today is made uh, under our old friend section 42 of the Planning Act, uh, which is a determination of applications to develop land without compliance with conditions 
previously attached, and as members will be aware, um, if approved, it would result in a new freestanding permission. Um, the site, as you can see uh, in the plan there, is uh, located in the west of the region on the coast, uh, eight kilometres to the north of Port Patrick and eight kilometres to the west of Strunrar. Looking at it in a bit more detail, whoopsie daisy, uh, we're going too far. Um, the site covers uh, 558 hectares and encompasses uh, both Larbrax and Gildenoch Moors and it's located entirely within the uh, Rins Coast Regional Scenic Area. It's just a quick uh, look at the site layout there. Um, a quick bit of background uh, to the application. Um, it is set out in uh, paragraph 1.2 of the report on pages 125 and 126 uh, of your committee papers. Uh, the original planning application uh, for this one was 15 P10044, which uh, was refused by members um, at the Planning Applications Committee of August 2015. Uh, it was subsequently appealed uh, to the Scottish Ministers who allowed the appeal uh, in October 2016. Um, the application as we have it today uh, seeks to amend, replace and introduce new conditions uh, of the extant permission. So in terms of the amendments, uh, the applicant is looking to amend conditions 1 and 10. Condition 1 is the uh, time to implement the development and they are looking for an increase uh, from 3 years to 5 years. Uh, for various reasons, and condition 10 uh, is to increase the maximum tip height of the turbines on site uh, and increase uh, to 110 metres from 100 metres that has consent currently. Uh, in terms of replacement, conditions 26 to 30 uh, were put on the, con the consent by the reporter and these cover noise and they're looking to replace uh, these conditions with a new condition 26. Uh, it's rather long, uh, eight pages to be precise, and it's included in your report at Appendix 1, uh, pages 150 to 157 uh, of your report. Uh, in terms of new conditions, uh, two new conditions are proposed. Uh, condition 27, which covers shadow flicker, or uh, a procedure uh, to, uh, to go forward to investigate any complaints of shadow flicker. Um, and condition 28, is for the removal of five smaller wind turbines uh, located nearby. Um, just run through one or two more slides. Um, I know um, members don't always like to, to have a look at comparative uh, sort of figures and things, but uh, I'll, if you can bear with me, just these next two. The um, turbine on the left is the one that has consent, and the one on the right is the, uh, the 10 meter higher one. And the next slide should just be a side elevation of that one there. Uh, looking at the ZTV um, for the proposed 110 meter tip heights, you can see that uh, the bulk of the turbines are available, available, <laughs> viewable, out to sea, um, and also within uh, sort of five kilometers of the application site, you can see the, uh, the patches of color there, and uh, also visible uh, sort of 10 to 15 kilometers out on the east side of Loch Ryan, she can see in the uh, in the picture there. Um, cumulative development. This uh, is one of the applicant slides, um, and this shows uh, cumulative development greater than 50 meters um, within various distances from the application site. So you can see just down to the uh, the southeast is the uh, the currently operational North Rins wind farm. The next one. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's running away with itself. Uh, right. Uh, this is uh, this is showing pretty much all cumulative development round about it. Um, so this uh, this is from our own turbine database. Um, I know members have uh, wanted to see all uh, all of these in the past. Um, running through some of the visuals. Um, we'll run through these just now. Um, all these visuals are the proposed ones. Um, I'm not proposing to show. Uh, a differentiation between them. This is just what the applicant is proposing just now. So this one is uh, close to uh, Miko Galdenoch, which is, is is fairly close to the, the application site, as you can see. And this is from the core path on Larbrax Moor. 
And again, this is uh, this is in a parking area uh, near Miko Galdera, which I think is just visible through the trees, a little block of white there. This is from the closest main road, the B738. So you can see the, the turbines. Uh, Sometimes they don't replicate themselves so well, but they, they sort of, the, the turbines are in the distance between the two telegraph poles just over the horizon there. And that's from the road again. This is from the Agnew Monument. So we can see the turbines there in the distance. I think it's just about to splurge forward again. Go on. Oh, yep. Okay, right. Uh, so that's Saluton Hill. <coughs> Viewpoint nine, High Ochenil. You can see just in the foreground there. The uh, you can't really see the blades, but that's um, that's a an old school horizontal access two blade turbine just uh, sitting in the foreground there. Um, this is from the parking area near Killintringan Lighthouse. Uh, apologies if that's not the correct pronunciation. Uh, and then from South Cairn, we can just make them out in the distance. As I say, sometimes they don't replicate so well in the PowerPoint. And the last one should be uh, from the Stranraer to Belfast ferry. Um, you can see in the in the visualizations the. Uh, the operational Northrens uh, wind farm is located to the left of the turbines that you can just make out there. <clears throat> just. So that's the last uh, view slide that we have. Um, the council's landscape architect has objected to the proposal, uh, specifically the uh, the proposal to alter condition 10. Um, her response is summarized at uh, paragraph 2.8 of your report on page 131. Um, and just the very last uh, point that she makes there um, is that the proposed development would introduce incongruous and intrusive large scale wind farm development on a stretch of regionally important and RSA designated North Rins coastline. If I can just move on to the next slide. Okay, so looking at the conditions um, of the extant consent, which is really the specifics of, of the application um, in front of us today, um, as members will be aware, um, the use of conditions uh, are covered in Planning Circular 4, 1998, and all these uh, these tests, these are the six tests of conditions, um, will be familiar to members. It's on the first page of your committee papers every month, so. I would hope that you would be. Um, so they cover things like necessity, precision, uh, reasonableness, uh, etc. So looking at the first condition, um, which is time for implementation. Now, uh, members might be aware that we had a similar um, issue uh, in front of you uh, in July uh, for housing site Queensbury Bray in Thornhill. Um, changes to current practice um, and legislation means that time conditions are no longer added. Uh, to permissions when we issue them. Um, therefore, in this case, um, condition one, uh, we don't consider it to be necessary uh, as it's superfluous um, to the determination of this and it can be discarded from any decision notice that we issue. Um, just to bring members' attention to late comments that I had in from the, um, the applicant's agent, I had a, a, a series of emails the other day uh, from them, uh, unsurprisingly, they don't agree with how we've um, approached um, our determination of this application, and they sent various um, appeal decisions um, demonstrating, in their words, that the uh, decision maker is able to allow the variation of, of one condition but not others. Um, obviously, this isn't um, the the approach that we've taken, we've uh, we've looked at all the conditions that they've applied to vary. Um, they would like us to um, reissue the original permission uh, either with condition one as altered or dropped altogether and the permission uh, reissued. Um, that's not something that um, I looked at in, in, in this application in itself. We looked at um, all the conditions, but um, if members are sympathetic uh, to that one. I, I do believe that there is a, a, a facility to uh, 
to do that if uh, if you're otherwise uh, minded for that. Uh, condition 10 um, is to do with the, the tip height. So we can see the two um, conditions there. Um, 100 meters was uh, was what the uh, the reporter granted. The, um, the applicant seeks to increase that to 110 meters, as outlined in the uh, the LVIA in paragraphs 4.18 to 4.35 of the report. The proposal is considered uh, to be contrary to uh, LDP policies IN1, IN2, NE2, NE9, and OP1C, and and various. Um, bits of uh, associated supplementary guidance. Um, in this circumstance, we uh, we consider it neither necessary nor reasonable um, to alter the condition, um, just because it brings it into direct conflict with the LDP. Uh, I'm going to skip over new condition 26 uh, for the time being, because it kind of ties into uh, condition 28, and I'll cover that in just a, in just a moment. Um, condition 27, um, cover shadow flicker. Now there was no um, there was no uh, mention of shadow flicker in the original permission. It is a development management consideration uh, in policy IN2. Um, therefore, um, we consider that the the, the the new condition is is necessary and relevant, and uh, we don't really have any issue with it per se. Um, condition 28 uh, relates to noise in a way, as, uh, as does the new condition 26. Um, the applicant uh, submitted new noise information based on the proposed 110 meter turbine types, um, obviously with an increase uh, in turbine height, larger rotors, more noise um, as, the, as the turbines uh, turn around. Uh, in the information they submitted, they, um, they said that uh, the noise from five wind turbines, five small wind turbines in the vicinity hadn't been included in the cumulative noise model, um, and Condition 28 seeks their removal. Um, we consider this to be unnecessary, um, as the original application uh, didn't require the removal to implement the decision. But we also view it to be uh, unreasonable and possibly unlawful to use a condition to uh, nullify existing implemented lawful development. Um, going back to condition 26, um, because of the question of the five small turbines um, in, in the being excluded from the noise modeling, um, we have questions over the precision of uh, condition 26. Um, which is somewhat ironic given that the, it's eight pages long and we consider it to be imprecise. Um, but that's, uh, that's, that's the view we took. Um, overall, uh, the, the plan and service uh, can't support the proposal. Um, we do acknowledge that there is a level of local support um, for this proposal um, based on the uh, letters of representation that we received and the community council responses that we also had in uh, for this one. A lot of it's based on community benefit, but for the reasons um, outlined in the report, um, we recommend that this application is refused. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Amy, can you open the curtain again, please? And we're up to mem members' questions for the officer. And, uh, Thanks. Um, I appreciate the comments uh, not made by yourself, but uh, 2.8b on page 131, um, I would have liked to have seen the whole quote rather than just a paraphrase of uh, some bits taken out. The proposal is contrary to a number of provisions of the development plan. Uh, da, 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 there remains a significant development plan policy conflict because the, the question really is, are there any extra turbines? Are they in different positions? And that's the first question, and I'll, I'll come back. And that view from the ferry, is that the, is that the same view we, u we used in the initial um, consideration of the original when, when we refused permission and it was then overturned? Or is that a new picture? Chris? Uh, an answer to the first question is uh, no. There's uh, no new additional turbines proposed. Um, the site layout that that was there is is the layout that currently has uh, planning permission. Um, the nature of the Section 42 application is 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 to take something that already has consent and change 
some of the conditions um, for that. Um, as far as I know, having had a, a, a quick look at the original application, the, um, they reused a lot of the, um, the same viewpoints um, from them. Obviously, they didn't take, they didn't use all of them because there were a lot more. But the one from the ferry um, was 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 one that they used before. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, that was that's what I thought was my understanding. Okay. Um, so that. Point B made by the Council Landscape Architect is actually really important because that's the only objection. And the, the <coughs> reporter, in their wisdom, sought to overturn the original decision. So there must be more than that that actually gave them the, um, the reasons for overturning that decision. And, and I think that, that, that single paragraph is the crux of this whole thing here. Because is this a rerun? Oh, Planning application one, as opposed to the thing it went to appeal. Um, I don't think it is. This is actually to see if we're going to let them uh, alter the size of the turbines more than anything else. So that B statement appears to me um, that it's a like a try to rerun the, the original thing, and I'm, that's why I think that that missing part of the quote is really important. Is that a statement or a question? Asking her what is the whole, that whole quote, yeah. I'll get David the answer. Basically, the reporter went through it bit by bit, and you know that's that's all available online information as well. The when they looked at it, the reporter concluded that it was contrary to uh, a number of the provisions of the development plan, but the overriding weight he gave to it was the contribution it made to the Scottish government's energy generation policy. So that overrode the local development plan in this instance, in his opinion, which is why he granted permission. The comments of the landscape architect really relate to the fact that, well, she, in fairness, being consistent here, she objected first time round. It was refused by the council first time round. This is making it another 10 metres higher and therefore more visible. So it would be surprising for her to come back and say anything else. Helene. Yeah, I can, I can see that the landscape um, architect is going to make the same points <coughs> about both as she made it at the previous application. The thing that I wonder though, however, and, you, and we uh, have already been discussing the, the issue of what the, the grounds at which it was overturned, is that if it was on the basis of the contribution to the Scottish government, government's energy targets, would it not be likely that if we refuse this, it just gets overturned again by the reporter? Because it's going to make even more contribution to the Scottish Government's energy tar targets, in which case is it maybe not a bit pointless for us to refuse it because it's just going to get overturned. We see on item 13 that we t we refused something that was taken to appeal and then award uh, expenses were awarded against the Council. So you sort of think, well, what's the point, you know? Because <laughs> and one of the points is there's no point in having policy if we're going to just ignore it. If the Scottish Government want to make a decision that's contrary to what we do, then as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's a privilege they have. David? Yes, I mean, I, I think the, the key thing is that the reporter accepted it was a finely balanced decision the first time round. And therefore, by making it, you know, in, the, in the words of the landscape architect, increased in height would worsen the significant adverse effects anticipated by the consented proposals. So if something is going to make it worse, then the advice of the Scottish Government themselves is that it shouldn't be renewable energy at any cost. It's going to be the right development in the right place. If this is making it more intrusive, then the argument that certain landscape architects are putting forward is that we shouldn't be supporting that. In Maitland. So, sorry, can I just um, chair? <laughs> sorry, Chris. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, can I just um, follow up on, on, on something that, um, that David has said? There have been um, subsequent appeal decisions where um, reporters have looked at uh, the contribution of development towards um, the, the renewable energy targets. There, there, there have been changes uh, to policy nationally, and I have included it in, in the report um, in the other matters, page 147, um, with that. Um, and I've, I've kind of given my own sort of view um, on that, but I think, um, you know, even if the change in national policy does, you know, um, represent a change in the need for renewable energy development, does it really follow that the demand must be met by development that would otherwise be refused planning permission? Um, I just thought I would add that in just as a 
and aside to, to do Thanks for that, Chris. Yes. I've got Jane and then Andrew just there. Jane. Uh, uh, th thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Sutty's made my first point, which was that the reporter um, came from this on an on balance, very much an on balance um, decision. Um, and um, I think we've got to remember that we're dealing with physical planning here. Uh, we're talking about increasing the hub height by um, uh, 10 meters. And uh, my feeling um, with respect to um, what uh, the statutory consultees said is that nobody's actually said, goodness me, what we really, really want and looking forward to having is another 10 meters high. Um, nobody said that. They haven't said that. They, they, they've said that they're happy with the reporter's uh, decision on the previous um, planning application. And, um, and of course, that still remains extant. There is no change to that. That simply remains. So what the, uh, the developer is looking for is belt and braces here, um, and very understandably so. But um, it really won't make a great deal of difference. Um, and I think that we should be consistent. And in the past, we said it wasn't suitable um, for um, landscape reasons. And I see no reason whatsoever to deviate from that. Um, so I'm perfectly happy, um, if I'm allowed to at this point, to... Well, no in session, Jane. My, We're not in session. My apologies. Andrew. Thanks, Chair. I was just surprised, Chair, because having been to both Kirkham and Stranraer Community Councils, they, were, they both have an agreement that they were going to write in support for this as well. So I was just asking about that. Did they miss the targets or have they been in contact at all because they've not been reported? Um, if, if they're not listed, then they didn't get back in touch. I mean, as a statutory consultee, I know um, when we take comments, we normally have a, a cut-off date, but because they're, they're statutory consultees, we would basically allow them, you know, as much time as they needed to make a to make a comment. It's, that tends to be how I, how I view that one. It's still questions for officers. Andy and John. Um, thanks. Just for clarity. So the comments are Cairnryan Community Council, Stony Kirk Community Council, um, and everyone else there on this application. Am I right? Chris. John. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wonder why the phrase significant adverse cumulative impact <coughs> was used in the recommended decision text for this development but in the previous development, I mean, this development has eight turbines at 110 metres. The previous one had 30 turbines at almost 150 metres. Yet we never had a phrase like that used with the previous one. So why have you decided upon that phrase for this one? It may be individual officers' phrase or re recommendations or other reports differently. But uh, David or Chris, can you help? Um, it's... I suppose it's it's the view that I took and the, the landscape architect as well. It's it's in accumulation with the existing North Rins um, wind farm, which is located just to the to the southeast of of this one. So taken together, so that. If there are no more questions for the case officer, it's not a speaking item. Therefore, now in session, Jane Maitland and then David McKee. Um, thank you for coming back to me, Chairman. Yes. Uh, um, if I could simply continue to say that I think we should go with the recommendation in order to be consistent. So I'm happy to propose that. Thanks, Jane. David McKee. Hi, thanks, Chair. Given yeah. we've had these in the past, it's, it's more or less a, an appeal against the reporter's decision. Uh, we've referred them back to the reporter before, and I think we should do the same again. I, I'd yeah. agree with Jane. So are you seconding Jane's motion? Andrew? And Andy. Thank you, Chair. Well, the way I see it, this is a new committee with a new outlook. Um, and I would be happy to approve this because I actually disagree with the landscape architect. The way the rims is actually, the, if you look at the actual hills and that, this is pretty much, you're not going to see it. We saw it on the ZTV. The actual, the, the actual visuals of it, you'll not see it from, you'll only see it from very few point or if you're coming from Ireland. So I disagree with the, the landscape ar architect's objection. Also, it's one of the few times when I've not seen an objection from anyone to a wind turbine. And we're all about local democracy. So I would say that we should 
we, we should push this through, um, subject to the conditions, and um, I would put it through as, what's the word, contrary to policy. Right, and it's not to do with contradicting the landscape architect, because that's a professional opinion. Yours might vary for that, but uh, so we'll get the language right in a minute. Andy? Well, I was actually going to suggest that it, um, the contribution to the energy targets and economic benefits outweigh the concerns about visual impact. So we should uh, award. Is that a counter amendment or is Andrew happy to endorse that one? I'm happy to endorse that if it's competent. Good question. Uh, did somebody take note of what Andy said there to see if it has a competent amendment to the motion? Well, that, I mean, that, that's, I would say that's fine because you're talking about it's the larger turbines are going to make a, a greater contribution. Than, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ivan? Chair, Chris mentioned something about was it condition of the new proposed condition 26 was imprecise, although it's eight pages. Are we now? This seems to be sort of resolving around whether it's 100 meters, 110 meters. Now, from a mile, I don't think I could tell you which was 110, which was 100. But what's the effect of agreeing this? Are we actually agreeing the new conditions as well? Because they might not actually reflect what we, we believe was going to be put in place with the old conditions, and they might, as Chris said, uh, be imprecise. So should we actually just have a wee bit more or from maybe Councillor Tristy, what the actual uh, impact of having these new conditions are? Because I think under the old conditions, I might have accepted the extra 10 metres, but what does this new conditions actually mean? Is there, is there, a, is there, a, a, is there a, an opportunity, maybe the wrong word, to defer this for a month to get further information if we're saying there's not enough information to hand today? David, can you just re reply to either, please? This is actually a surprisingly simple application and an incredibly complicated one, which... Cre which Chris and I have spent the last couple of days trying to get our heads around uh, the last minute request. At its simplistic term, they're applying to change a number of conditions, which will make it higher, will make it on the site longer, and will have some effect in terms of the, the noise and how it's monitored and regulated. We've got some concerns about both the visual impact and, as Chris outlined earlier, the issue of whether or not the, it, it's precise, whether it's at actually even competent to go and require turbines, existing turbines to be removed uh, by condition. Uh, and Chris has quite correctly alluded in this to the, the correct way to do that is to get a, an unopposed revocation rather than to try and attach a condition. The, the one issue which is still floating out there, and I must confess I'm wrestling a little bit with it as to how to correctly approach it, is the, the applicant has come back and said, we think you can deal with this just with condition one, as a, to use the horrible phrase, the backstop position, that if you're going to be, <laughs> if you're going to refuse us, please just grant us um, another permission for an extra five years. So just look at condition one, forget the rest. Now, I find that really difficult because they've applied for, Chris counted it, was a 102 word description? It's a long description up there. And we've looked at it as an entity. I recognize that in law you can, under a Section 42 application, take certain conditions which have been requested and amend them, and, but not others. The clear advice that I've gone back to the primary legislation that says if the council um, decide that planning permission should be granted subject to the same conditions as those subject to those which previous planning permission was granted, they shall refuse the application. So in that case, that's why we think you should be refusing it as an entity. The only way around this is if members are sympathetic towards this and want to approve it contrary to recommendation, I would suggest what might be worth doing is 
deferring it for a month so we can go back and ask them to amend, well, actually it wouldn't even need to come back to committee if you mind to approve it, we've just under delegated powers, get them to put in an amended description so it's quite clear we're only talking about condition one and nothing else. Um, but it, it, it's it's an incredibly complicated situation, I'm afraid. I do Have apologize. Have you got that request in writing, David, that uh, under certain circumstances they would accept only condition one? No, but that is basically what they are asking us to do by email. They've emailed. Yeah, they, they have put it in. What they haven't done is said that they are prepared to amend the description, which I would feel far more comfortable if they were doing that, because otherwise we are going to have to, as a planning authority, amend their application. Is their application not ours? In terms of the description, I'm I'm uncomfortable about doing that. Ivor. So we take it the other way. If we actually refuse this. We're just about saying this isn't going to go ahead because the plan application will fall because of time lapse. Exactly. Yeah. It runs out, when is it, Chris, next summer? October next year. Yeah. But they could come back, David, with another application for simply a, a condition one. Indeed. The, I mean, if they'd actually applied for that, we would simply strike condition one because, as Chris explained earlier, it's not a condition which we would have attached, uh, with all due respect to the reporter who did attach it. Uh, it's not in legislation now. You're you're supposed to just have it by a, a directive. So I don't personally have an issue with it, the, what was approved on appeal being allowed for another five years. It is, as we know, it's a, it's a fee dodge. Um, basically, this is a £202 fee. If you put a whole renewal application, it's, the fee would be £125,000. So, members, without becoming too complicated, we can either go with a vote, which is uh, to approve or, or to refuse, and we'll still to get the wording from Aunt, this Andy now, or we can defer it for a month to see what the applicant says and have David bring back a response. I think. Sorry, sir. <laughs> if, if the committee are minded to refuse the application, if you want to approve it, then that's fine. We just issue, we vary all the conditions as they've requested, uh, and that's, they get a whole new permission. If members are minded to refuse it, really what the applica applicant is saying is, please don't just refuse it. Uh, can you not just renew it and give us an extra period of time? Uh, now, it is also in your gift to say, well, no, actually, we're not willing to have it for any longer. We're willing to just refuse it full stop, which is what we'd originally recommended. So, Member David McKee. With all due respect, they got permission from the reporter. <coughs> and now, because they're not happy with the reporter's decision, they've come back for us to overturn it. And no, the person. No. They withdraw it no. a number of. Amend it. Amend it, okay, sorry, amend it. Now, with all due respect to the members here, I think they went to the reporter before because we refused it. Let them go back to the reporter again and see if he'll amend it for them. There might no need to if it's approved. But on that basis, we'll just go to the vote. Can you, Andy, can you and Andrew just uh, rephrase your proposal? Elaine? Can I just ask something about proposed condition 28? Because you're saying there, it is also debatable whether it would be lawful to attempt to do so by the way of the imposition of a condition. So if it was approved, have we done something unlawful in allowing that? Condition. No, it's not about that. Well, they're volunteering to take this. They're saying that we should place a condition to, 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 have, to have the turbines removed. Mm. But David's advice is that wouldn't be lawful. It'd be far better, or, or Chris's advice yeah. is, it'd be I'm far better if they volunteered to remove them. In terms of the motion, if the motion is to approve, that would be approving condition 28, presumably, which may not be lawful. Right, so, so I suppose there is an issue about that because we can't have members making a decision that might be unlawful. So in terms of condition 28, David, what do we do? Well, obviously you, you've got the, um, the amendment before you, which is to just approve it, but we do have some concerns about whether or not it is lawful to do that because really the only way to revoke a permission is to go through the revocation process 
we would suggest an unopposed revocation in this instance would be the, the correct way because if you do a, an opposed revocation, then the council actually has to pay compensation. Thankfully, it doesn't appear that would be the case here, but to have a condition requiring an, a lawful turbine to be removed, I don't think is particularly competent. So I, I would be uncomfortable about having that attached, but um, obviously that's maybe something for the courts to decide whether or not it is lawful or not. But I think all I think we said in the report was it's debatable whether it's lawful. It's not absolutely cast iron illegal. So now the members that are supporting the amendment have a dilemma. If it's no lawful, you may be placing the council in an unlawful or, or, or a serious position. If it helps, I don't think there's an awful lot of risk to the council by virtue of the fact that, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but do they not have control of those so they can actually require their removal? The, the turbines uh, in question are, are shown as within the application site, so um, I am assuming that they have some form of control over them. I think it would be better to defer members. To get to, I think it was simpler to defer to get a, a, a position whereby we can say this would fly or this would be acceptable or else just refuse and invite them to come back with another another uh, application that sets out try simpler what it is they're looking to achieve. I've got Ivor and then Jane. Chair, I would move that we defer because I've heard some comments said today that make me uncomfortable to take a decision either way when people are saying show us the colour of their money that should suggest that we want money for our applications and I don't think that should be saying be said in this uh, chamber. I'm quite sure it was tongue in cheek or insolence rather than any proposal for money but uh, Jane. Uh, I'm absolutely sure it was it, it was a joke um, and um, and we've we've said already that this should be taken on the basis of physical planning reasons. Um, I have to say that um, the that I would be perfectly happy to go ahead, um, Chairman, but it is really, I think, largely in your gift to decide what to do, because the cleanest way is to decide, um, and um, the cleanest way, in my view, would be to refuse it, safest and cleanest, and then it's up to the uh, to the um, applicant to come forward. Um, but it is in your gift. That's my. Okay, I've got Elaine, Andy, and and Andrew. Uh, can I second uh, Councillor Hislop's proposal for a deferral? Okay. I was um, just looked at Andrew there, and we're happy to go with a deferral um, to get more information. I think that's the wise course of action. If members, if that's the, the view, are there, are there any alternative views to, to a deferral? Joe McKee. Yes, we put a, a motion in earlier on to, to refuse it, to go with the recommendations to you. My, my reading of what's here is if we refuse it, their, their planning permission that they got for the the guy in Edinburgh, the is st is st the reporter, is still a, a, an application that they can use. So, do you do you want to continue with us today? I, th I think we should refuse it, Chair, and that's it. Okay, and who's your seconder? Jane, and Jane, are you withdrawing that second now? No, no. Um, I mean, I presume we're on a procedural motion about whether we are going to defer or whether we're not going to defer. Is that what we're on about now? That's what we're on about now. And I did okay. ask if there was any alternative view to defer. Right. So we're going to have to have a vote to see whether to defer it or whether to go with the... Ah, sorry. Can, can I just ask a question of clarification about timings on this? Have we got time to do... If there is a deferral, have we got time to do that? Because obviously applications take time to go through process. Oh, but it's no other application. The deferral is time for officers to discuss with the applicant about what the outcome might be best that suits them and they can re revisit what's being proposed. Uh, if, if it's a refusal, then the, the, there is a process the applicant have to put in place. Deferral stops all that. So we need to decide, first of all, Nick, whether it's a deferral or a, a decision today. And you've got a move for a deferral by Ivor, seconded by Jane. You've got a move today to... to no. Elaine. By Elaine. Elaine, sorry. And you've got a move to, to, to continue and determine today by David McKee. Is there a seconder for David? Jane Maitland. So you've got a de 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 deferral or determine today. And the motion's the deferral.
Carry on, Nick, please. Just, just um, to clarify then, so everyone's clear, we've got the motion, which is for deferral. Now, that's moved by Councillor Hislop, seconded by Councillor Murray. And we've got the, um, the amendment or counter-proposal proposed by Councillor McKee and seconded by Councillor Maitland um, that we have enough information to determine the application today. So... Happy to move next. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor John Campbell. Motion. Councillor Blake. Motion. <coughs> Councillor Doogie Campbell. Motion. Councillor Driver. Amendment. Councillor Ferguson. Motion. Councillor Juicy. Motion. Councillor Hislop. <coughs> Councillor Lee, <coughs> Councillor Lever, motion. Councillor Maitland, amendment. Councillor Martin, Councillor McKee, amendment. Councillor Murray, motion. Councillor Tate, Councillor Young, motion. Okay, so vote, vote. we have 12 members voting in favour of the motion and three in favour of the amendment. Therefore, the motion is carried and the application is deferred. And next month, Chris will bring a definitive view from the applicant as to what they want us to determine. No, 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 <laughs> no, I know what I'm saying, no. It'll be on the table for members to decide uh, that application will still be live or an alternative that Chris and the applicant have discussed within the next few weeks. Come to next month's meeting, hopefully. <laughs> right, OK. Oh, thanks, Chris. So I take it that will then also include a view whether our motion was legally enforceable or not. Run this past the... Oh, you're talking about section... Uh, uh, condition 28. Yes, the information will come back with that as well. Thanks, Andy. Aye. Okay. Amy, c can you see if uh, Councillor Nicholl wants to join us? He wants to speak at this next agenda item, and he might want to watch the proceedings. I elected members are allowed to speak whether it's an speaking <laughs> item or no. Hey, we. You get five minutes. Just a three. Uh, it's not. It's not. A, it's not a major application, is it? No, it's three. Aye, behave yourself, John. <laughs> we. Good, good. We move on to agenda item twelve: formation of hard standing and change of use of land for siting of six caravans for accommodation for agricultural workers, an installation of shared septic tank, and soak away its retrospective. At Billy's Farm, Kelton, Castle Douglas. It's a full application, premise numbers 18 stroke 1246 stroke full. The recommendation is to refuse. And talking us through this is Pat Hannah on behalf of Judith, who's no with us today. So, Pat, when you're ready, will you take us through this uh, application, please? Chair, hey, Chair, could I make a quick declaration, please? Sure um, thing, do you? Uh, I was contacted by the applicant yesterday. Um, who wished to speak to me regarding the application. I did not express any opinion or view, so I can continue to participate in the debate. Thanks, Dougie. A Amy, can you close the curtains again, please? Can we have a ready, Pat? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. OK, Billy's Farm is located some five kilometres or so um, southwest of Castle Douglas on the Roanhouse to Tongland Road and forgive my voice, um, this is the site plan showing the six proposed <coughs> caravans with the farm steadings to the north and the access road to the south. Moving on to the photographs, this is the view from the access itself with the caravans uh, just in the distance. 
and moving closer to the caravans, moving over into the field, and a reverse view looking back at the caravans from the farmsteading. In summary, there's no policy support for permanent occupation of caravans um, as dwelling houses. Caravans are only intended to be suitable as temporary accommodation. Instead, where an essential need for agricultural workers to live at a farm can be demonstrated, permanent planning permission can be granted for permanent dwellings, but no adequate case has been put forward in this instance. Accordingly, as set out in the report, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Amy, can you open the cut again, please? Members, questions to the case officer? None. Oh, Ivor. Could you just say what it means by temporary? If I moved in there as a worker and I stayed there three years and then moved to a permanent residence when one became available or I was to move on to another job, it's my temporary residence, whereas the actual building is permanent. Now, we have a situation whereby in Dumfries and Galloway, if you watch the likes of the standard, as soon as one farmer looks for a new dairyman, there's a knock-on effect. And now these are, <coughs> my understanding is for workers on the, it's a large dairy unit. Therefore, you're going to have people in and out of that job because they're moving on to other premises, etc. So they might not be able to, you know, six caravans must be six people minimum, they require somewhere. If there's nothing in the local area that would cover that, how do you then actually have workers on site unless you have a temporary solution? Pat? Thanks, Chair. Um, this, this is an application for the permanent siting of the caravans in the same way as the permanent erection of a dwelling house could have a series of occupants, so could uh, the permanent siting of caravans have a series of occupants. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the council's policy, um, which is uh, policy H7 on temporary residential development, uh, um, explicitly states that uh, the council will not normally support proposals for the development of caravans to houses. Um, and so the council's policy is quite clear that we shouldn't have uh, permanent caravans used as houses. However, not normally. That would suggest that there is scope there. It's not something we do normally, but in exceptional circumstance. And I would suggest that in this situation, whereby if you put in for six cottages on a farm, a guarantee you under H, is it H3 or H2, you wouldn't stand a hope in hell of getting them. Um, because, well, there'll be a, have you looked at local villages? Well, six properties might not be up in the local villages. So I would think under exceptional circumstances, there is a reason to actually look at this. You, you are still in questions to the case officer here. <coughs> hey, Andy Ferguson. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I should maybe wait a wee bit, but I, I think what I'm getting here from the application site, if I'm right here, 17, 27, 2170 FUL. We knocked it back. That was, when was that in? Was that June this year just? Um, have we any idea how long these have actually been there? <coughs> okay, thank you, Chair. Um, the... I, I, I can't say with any certainty how long these uh, caravan units have been there. I know that um, the enforcement team investigated them, which resulted in the application being um, submitted. Um, what did happen was that, this, and you can see this from the history on page 162, was that um, uh, there was an application by the same applicant at Borland and Balmagee Farm for six units. And in that instance, they were for temporary units, and we approved those on face value that um, there was a temporary need that needed to be met there. 
when we got the second application, 17 forward slash 2170 full, um, from the same applicant at uh, a different farm for six more, um, so in total 12 caravans for farm workers, um, we said, well, okay, well, we can't take this at face value anymore. We need to see some detailed justification that wasn't provided. And as a result, um, uh, that, that most recent application was refused. The only difference between the current application and the previous one is that it is now for permanent siting of those units rather than temporary siting. And I can also say that um, uh, the supporting statement that was submitted with the earlier application did um, uh, indicate that they were for temporary. It was acknowledged that they were temporary caravans and that the applicant would be seeking more permanent solutions over the temporary period of three years. Thanks, Pat. And on page 162, the first paragraph top of the page tells you they've been in there since December 2017, so they've been there about 10 months. Yes, Andy. Um, thanks. Have you any idea how many... Uh, is there one per caravan? Because, I mean... If... No idea. No idea. Jeff? Pres presumably these are people on permanent contracts. It's not seasonal work. It's where they'll... Uh return back to wherever they uh, not normally reside? Um, well, if seasonal caravans were required, then planning permission wouldn't be needed for those. Uh, there are permitted development rights uh, available for farms uh, that allow <coughs> siting of caravans for seasonal work. Uh, this is for permanent siting, um, so they would be permanently occupied. Any other questions for the case officer? Elaine? Just read it as a matter of interest. The um, application which for the, for the other farm at Moreland of Balmarkey uh, was granted conditionally on the 5th of July. And what was the condition? Was the condition that uh, they sought permanent accommodation? But, thanks, Chair. It was just purely to limit the permission to 36 months. Okay, Andrew. Thanks, Chair. One of the things that I've read on page 163 was a letter from the NFU, which um, states about a lot of young um, folk in the dairy sector who don't have a, they don't have the means to drive there. So perhaps they've got a permanent residence at home with mum and dad, but they because they've got no means of transport, they actually need something like this year round to do their work during the week. So, so if what's the what I'm getting at here is the fact that we're saying that it would be all right to do temporary seasonal caravans. So why why is this kind of something different when it's a little bit like a caravan park? All right. Um, if if we're pr approving, uh, well, if we're considering caravans as dwelling houses, then we have to think about whether they are suitable for permanent occupation. Um, are caravans suitable for permanent occupation, um, or should we be seeking better quality, uh, better designed environments for people to live in? Um, the applicant has stated, you, you made reference to, to the report, that, um, uh, that many of the, the workers here can't drive. Um, I, I would counter that and, and state in the report that um, uh, from a planning perspective, it's inappropriate to cite workers um, uh, where they are remote from any settlements, services, facilities, shops, and so on. Um, there are plenty of organizations that uh, uh, pick up vehicles or use vehicles to pick up employees to work on a, a facility. Um, it's not necessary to have uh, someone working or living on the site in order to work there. There is a risk as well. If you write a new council policy, if you can't drive, you get building up in a caravan where you like. The recent gallery would be in some state, I would imagine. John Martin? And on these caravans got main services into them. Are they mainly serviced, Pat? I can see gas there. Um, water is from a private supply and wastewater to a private septic tank. Electricity, presumably by generator or some other means. 
Hey, John Young. Okay, thank you. If this application was refused, would it refer back to the temporary accommodation? And when would that temporary accommodation finish? Temporary accommodation is a different location. The, the farm unit has been split into two. That's why I think this application is here. Pat? The application is for permanent siting. If it was refused, then um, the implication on that would be that the caravans would need to be removed or a further application would need to be submitted for temporary accommodation along with justification as to why that was necessary. Uh, Iva. Chair, if we don't, or our policy says we don't allow uh, caravans as permanent residences, why do we allow it as permanent residences on caravan park? Because I can think of Two, well, one used to be in my ward. I think it's maybe moved out. Uh, but definitely one in my ward where there are people who stay year-round as their main residence in a caravan. And I can think of one, I think it's Kirkpatrick Fleming, <coughs> when I was down leafleting during the election once, and there were some lovely caravans there, two stuck together, but they are caravans. And we allow that so as permanent residences. So what is the policy? David? The ones you're referring to actually have a long-standing historical permission which is unrestricted. So in terms of they require a site license from environmental health, but in planning terms we can't control that. Going forward, any new proposals that come in that require planning permission, the Council's policy is that they, they won't be for permanent uh, residences. Exactly for the reason Pat was saying, because really they're, they're not the quality of design and um, and frankly habitable nature that you would uh, wish to promote within uh, the area. If there are no other questions for the case officer, we have a elected member, Graham Nicholl, looking to address the committee. Graham, usual procedure, I'm sure you're well aware of it, three minutes. I will remind you of 30 seconds to go uh, to draw your presentation to a conclusion. And if you'd vacate the chamber after your presentation, I'm sure you'll be grateful. Just never get ready, Graham. Thank you. Chair, I heard you threatening a previous member who spoke with the toys, and I've no desire to get that, so I will leave immediately after <laughs> if there are no questions from members. Anyway, thank you, Chair. Um, the Wilson family farm uh, extensively in acreage terms, but they also farm very intensively in policy terms, and they are milking 2,500 cows and have the subsequent followers that, that come out of those cows to, to, to feed and to have on their farm. They milk three times a day, um, which is certainly in my day it was unusual, but it's certainly more, maybe more common now. They milk at eight in the evening, four in the morning, and midday. Um, so it's a 24-hour operation that they have. Um, they employ 35 full-time employees, uh, they have seven houses on the farm, but they're all occupied by farm workers, senior senior workers on the on the the the, the, the payroll. Um, all these farm workers are trained by the applicant, and they're inclined to stay reasonably long time. Um, there have been no objections from statutory consultees or the neighbours, um, and. I think that there is a justifiable need for the, these properties, these houses to be there. Um, they've been properly set up with parking arrangements, uh, drainage to a septic tank system, and private water supply. So, you know, they're, they're, they're properly set up. Um, I don't think of much more to say except that my understanding from the applicant is that he would be willing at this point to accept uh, 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 approval on it for a temporary permission for these sites, for these caravans. That's maybe throwing a, uh, uh, something into the water that wasn't there before, but that is the indication that I have from the applicant, that if it was not acceptable to members on a permanent basis, he would be willing to accept a temporary basis. Um, and I have no other comments to make, Chair. The applicant, of course, can't speak, but what would the basis of the temporary measure be? Would it be to allow them to 
find alternative accommodation elsewhere, or would it just be simply to delay matters until a future date? He desperately needs, my understanding is he desperately needs these workers to be there, um, and it would give him breathing space, if you like, to reassess the situation. Um, that is my assumption of what he said to me uh, earlier on. Thank you. Many members got questions for Graham. Dugan Elaine. Thanks, Chair. Graham, um, when Mr. Wilson phoned me, uh, he, he basically he described to me uh, the, the sort of makeup of the workforce. Um, are you able to tell us, because he didn't uh, disclose this, how many people are living in each caravan and are there family members or is it simply workers um, that are using these caravans for accommodation? Uh, Councillor Campbell, I don't have that information. I'm sorry, I don't know. Elaine? Again, it may not be something that uh, Councillor Nicholl can um, answer, but um, I've seen that, that uh, in June um, an application for temporary residential accommodation was refused under under delegated powers, and I'm wondering why the applicant didn't go to the local review body to appeal that decision, but instead put in a an application for um, permanent res uh, uh, permanent accommodation. Do you know why he didn't appeal it to? I'm sorry, I, I have no idea why that's the case. Maybe Pat or David can help me go into session, Elaine. Are there any other questions for Councillor Nicholl? In that case, Graham, thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Graham. Members, we're in session. David, can can you help, Elaine? Do you know why that particular process wasn't employed? Well, obviously, they would have had the, the right within three months to submit a notice of review, to, which would bring it to the local review body, but for whatever reason, they, they chose not to do so. Uh, I have to feel, I just feel a little bit suspicious about how this is panning out. So he has a, had an application uh, ref, for temporary accommodation refused. He doesn't appeal it. Instead, he puts in another one. It gets called into us, and then he can appeal it to the Scottish reporter thereby protracting the whole uh, process so that the caravans can can stay on site? Would I, am I being unduly cynical, do you think? Uh, an observation or a question? I suppose it's really an observation. We're still in session, members, Archie. Th thanks very much, sir. And, 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 and listening to, to Graham, you know, you, you feel, you know, that obviously the um, the employer needs need the workers, but the concern I have here is the history of all of this and the the, the, the refusal to go through um, the process of of the application and potentially the local review body understanding the needs. So um, unfortunately, on this occasion, I would have to say that we go with the recommendations here um, because that would be the safest way to do things. Ian Blake. Uh, can I just check with David? Uh, Councillor Nicol mentioned the fact that the the, uh, the applicant would be prepared to accept a temporary position. Uh, we're, is it, is it, is it uh, sorry, temporary application? Uh, we today, just to confirm, today we're looking at the application that's before us, not a temporary one. It's, it's the permanent one. Uh, can we, in fact, amend that? I, I wouldn't think so, David. Well. That was the very issue that was going through my mind when Councillor Nicola raised that, because if you look at paragraph 1.3 in the report, the agent has confirmed on the application form and by further email that the application is not for temporary permission, but instead seeks permanent planning permission. It's not been put in the actual description, if you look, but the fact they've put it on the form indicates that is what they're really seeking. I've been inclined to say, uh, as the Chair's just said, that that's what's before you. It's a permanent application. If he is minded to amend the application and it's temporary, then I think that actually needs to be explicit and with a further separate application. It'd be allowed. Be I mean, Elaine? But a, a, an application for a temporary accommodation has already been refused as recently as June under delegated powers. So we wouldn't really just be able to overturn that by condition, surely. David? Yes, I mean, there is a limit to how often people can submit applications which are identical. The, the authority can refuse 
to entertain applications which are duplicates and not determine a further application for five years if it feels it's been worn down just by attrition. But if a further application were to be submitted for a temporary period, um, then obviously it may well get called back into committee and you could take a different view to the case officers. <laughs> Uh, what you could obviously do is, in the same way as we talked about earlier um, with the, the one at Mosul, was uh, any further application should come to committee. So you're effectively withdrawing delegation. So if a temporary application comes in, it would automatically come to yourselves. And that would allow you to consider that one, which would uh, prevent the need for it being refused under delegated powers, going to the LRB, etc. Et I'm Dougie Campbell, Ian Blake, and Ira. Thanks, Chair. Um, just setting aside the, the debate about uh, approval for um, temporary um, siting of the, the caravans, I'm feeling really quite conflicted here because, um, the, uh, you know, mindful of the potential economic impact, a lot of people working um, on the farm using the caravans, the impact it has on the, the business. But, um, you know, my understanding is that these workers are working 55 hours a week, that's what I was told. Um, milking is taking, taking place three times a day. Um, it's not clear how many people are actually occupying <coughs> the, the, the caravans, but just to sort of go back to something Pat said, that caravans couldn't be considered to be permanent homes. Are we allowed, is it competent for us to consider the, the conditions under which these workers are living um, in that particular context? David? In terms of land use planning, all we're really looking at is the siting and the quality and the design of what's there. The internal arrangements of it is not something we can consider, but obviously, as Pat alluded to uh, earlier, I think the uh, paragraph 4.6, where it says clearly inappropriate from a planning perspective to site workers who cannot drive in a location where they have no access to services facilities or shops. So that bit is a material consideration. The internal arrangements within the caravans themselves we couldn't look at. Ian Blake and then Ivor. Thanks for letting me back in, Chairman. It's the, if we were minded to refuse the application uh, with whether it could be an encouragement for the applicant to consider a further application for, for a temporary period, it's under 418 that I've got a real concern that if the Planning Applications Committee agrees to refuse it, enforcement action will be pursued. Now, in this particular case, that would have significant implications on a, a very busy business. Uh, and it's whether or not that that, could, that element of it can be set back just now in case there is a further application, even for a temporary period. David? As most members will be aware, enforcement is not a quick process. You've got to serve a 272 notice first to establish the land ownership. You've then got to serve a notice of a 28-day lead-in period before it bites. Within that period, it can be appealed to the Scottish ministers. And then there's the compliance period. So we would normally, at a very minimum, require a three-month period uh, for something to take place. So on this sort of case where you've got a lot of um, works and you don't want to make people homeless. We would probably give a far longer period anyway, which, as I say, they would have a right of appeal to the Scottish ministers, which would also drag it out. So the chances are, um, with the best will in the world, even if you wanted those off the site tomorrow, the right of appeal would mean that you're probably talking about a year or so before they'd be removed anyway. Ivan? Yeah, that sort of answered the question I was going to ask, because if you were going in there with the... 28 days and 28 days and then there's a way that would have a drastic effect on the actual farm whereby people weren't there to actually do their jobs uh, and that would cause me concern. Um, I'm reassured slightly that it, we are going to be uh, more considerate because you're not going to solve this problem in two or three weeks. So. Um, we'll wait and see if another application comes in. Then. John Martin. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Council, this Council Driver have proposed, proposed that we go with the Office of Recommendation. I'll just second that because I think we're just getting bogged down here between permanent, temporary, and seem to be going around in circles. Okay. Any alternative proposals? 
take it if there's no that's unanimous, but I take it would members want a note that a future application comes before members. There's obviously a degree of sympathy toward the applicant and indeed toward the employees. And there's a clear signal that uh, I think from what, what we see here is not what we want as a, as a final uh, outcome as a group of static caravans. So I think in there somewhere there's a message to the applicant, an opportunity to come back and if members want, we can see what's being proposed, what's being asked for, Archie. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that, but I mean, I think we've got to give officers a rightful place here and under delegated powers that could be done. So, I mean, if the officer feels that there is something issue there, they can bring it back to sell, but the delegated powers is where this should be if it's in a temporary basis. On, on the basis that you understand what the outcome may be for, for, for staff and, uh, and the applicant, David? The question was asked about the standard of accommodation as well. <coughs> Do the housing officers have any input into being able to go and check what sort of accommodation they're getting? No, no I realise it's not a planning application. I appreciate that, but there's more to this application than just a planning application, if you didn't mind. But, but our, our duty is simply to determine the application, and that's nothing to do with what standard of living accommodation is. So that's a decision of members that delegated authority to officers, and it's refused. Nick, can you confirm the decision of the committee, please? Uh, yes, Chair. The decision is to refuse the application as set out in the report. Come to agenda item 13, which is for noting and information members will note the outcome and note the impact on the council of that decision. Yes. Content with that, noted. Thank you, and I have no other business. Thank you very much for the attendance today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I've got a question for you,